I am Dr. Kimberly Yellowrobe. I'm an enrolled member of the Rosebud Sioux Tribe. I am the Associate Director for Banner University Health Plans, and I am the Chairperson and Founder of the third annual, the first and the second and the third annual Tribal Youth Disability Summit. Um, I want to thank you all for joining us today. It's a very beautiful Saturday out there today. A couple powwows going on out there in the community, so be hitting the powwows later on this evening. Um, I'm going to turn this uh, over to our two MCs. We have Zoe Irwin, who is um, enrolled with the Rosebud Sioux Tribe as well. She's my daughter. And then we also have Mr. Adrian Shorty from the Salt River Pima Maricopa Indian Community that will be serving as your two MCs for this year's summit. So I'll turn it over to um, Zoe and Adrian to introduce themselves, and then we'll have our prayer. Morning, everybody. I'm Zoe Irwin. I am currently studying to become a speech language pathologist at Arizona State University, and I am your 2023 Tribal Youth Disability Summit MC. All right. Good morning, everyone. Yate. Um, my name is Adrian Shorty. I am from the Salt River Pima Maricopa Indian Community, and I am also the other half of your 2023. MC as well. I would also like to announce that we are going to have Anya here to start our morning off with a morning prayer. Good morning, everyone. My name is Anya Carrillo. I am a native uh, Hopi, Laguna, Lakota, and Seneca young youth. Um, I just would like to start off by saying good morning and thank you guys for coming. Um, and I'm going to start praying now. Dear Lord and Heavenly Father, Creator, just please bless us today as we go through this conference, Lord. I ask that you please watch over all the participants as they continue in their daily activities, as well as um, just participating in this conference that you have provided us today, Lord. I ask that you um, welcome them with open arms, Lord, today as they receive the new information that they may be learning about or old information so that their minds get wiser, Lord. I ask that you please just bless everyone who was able to attend and those who aren't able to attend, Lord, if there's any other reason for their non-attendance, whether it's sickness or illness or anything, Lord, I just ask that you watch over them and protect them as they're going through um, any times that they are going through, Lord. Lord, I just ask that you give the presenters wisdom and knowledge to speak um, what it is that they know is truth and let them know that... Um, the words that you have given them are guided by you, Lord and Creator. Lord, I just ask that you please um, protect everyone today and watch over them as they go through um, all that we're going through, Lord, and just their daily activities as well, Lord. Um, we acknowledge you and we love you, Lord, and we just ask these things in your name. Amen. Thank you very much for that, Anya. We're going to get started with our next keynote speaker. Dr. Daryl Daryl Harmon Joseph is a representative of Northern Arizona University. Daryl Joseph is, is Wunga, Coyote clan from the Hopi village of Lower Monkopi. First time pr <laughs> pronouncing these, sorry if I butchered it. Um, he is an assistant professor in the Department of Educational Specialties in Teaching and Learning at Northern Arizona University. His research is informed from his experience serving as an educator in special education and his focus on the intersection of disability with so sociocultural differences that inform educational inequities for American Indian and Alaskan Native youth. Great. Thank you, Anya. I appreciate that. I'm in Zoe. Um, I let me get my PowerPoint situated here. Okay, can you see my screen? Okay. Yep. Okay, perfect. Um, and let me minimize something here so I can see my own screen a little better. 
Well, good morning. Good morning, everybody. Um, uh, my Hopi name is Scylla, and great job, Zoe, for the pronunciation. I know that's a little bit of a difficult, a um, few difficult words to say. Um, my Hopi name is Scylla, which means breathing in the snow. And my English name is Daryl Harmon Joseph, as you heard, and I represent the Ba Islamwa clan, which means the Water Coyote clan from the village of Munkapi, a um, place where the water flows on the Hopi Nation, which is located in northwestern um, Arizona, some of you may, may know. Um, I am a middle-aged young Hopi man uh, with long black hair fixed um, in a braid. I am wearing a dark rim glasses with a short sleeve collared shirt and an orange stone eagle necklace. I have an image of my home community of Munkapi in the early spring showing a valley of budding cornfields scattered with peach trees throughout the small adobe style village. Um, and that village is to the top right of my screen in my background picture. I am married and I have five beautiful children. I'm a sibling to my older brother who has multiple disabilities um, and to my younger sister, a son to my father and mother. My mother is a retired special ed teacher um, and has had a great and continues to have a great influence in my own career as I too was a um, teacher of special education um, and also an administrator in the field. Um, in addition to that, as, as you heard, I am an assistant professor here at NAU um, in the Department of Ed Specialties, um, teaching um, pre-service prep teachers in special education. So it's wonderful to be here with you today. Um, thank you so much for the invitation. And I'm very sorry that I was not able to make the summit yesterday, but I hear that it was a great, great, great presentation. Um, so I, you know, I'm coming at this really just through a lens of having a conversation with you. And I hope that today um, I engage you in a great way. So get your typing fingers ready because I'm going to use the chat box. Um, uh, we may have a bit of time for a couple of you throughout the presentation to take yourself off mute and share verbally. Um, so I'd like you to participate. So, so warm up yourselves and, um, you know, let's, let's get started. My presentation today is called Building Community, Relationships, Responsibility, Reciprocity, and Redistribution. And so um, as we think about that, let me see if I can skip forward. Um, I, I want to start us off with this. Okay, what's your name? Um, where are you from? And what is your superpower. So if I can ask you to use the chat box, if you're in a position to do some typing, respond to those questions, okay? Introduce yourselves to the rest of the group signing in today. What is your name? Where are you from? And what is your superpower? Um, you know, what, what are the special things about you? Um, I, I, we wanna learn about that. So please take a minute or so um, to do that, and I invite anyone who would like to do that now verbally um, and share um, share that information with us. So let's give it a couple of minutes and, and just take yourself off mute if you are brave enough now to do that verbally. Okay, I see um, Betty Schoen from Chandler. Her power is kindness. Maria oh, would like a copy too. Um, Melissa Wasana, Epics, Albuquerque, New Mexico, being humble is her superpower. Bryza from Moose Lake, Minnesota, welcome. Brookie, hello, Brookie um, from Oklahoma. She didn't write that, but I do know Brookie. Um, her yes, hello. <laughs> Hi, you want to take a moment to introduce yourself quickly? Okay, sure. Um, Great. My name is Brookie Fixico Beasley, and I am a student at the University of Oklahoma, and I was a special education teacher, and now I am going to graduate school for special education transition to become a transition specialist. So I'm glad to be here. Thank you. Hey, welcome. Thank you, Brookie, and thank you for doing that. Again, if anybody wants to jump in after Brookie, 
just jump right in. I will give you the time to do that as I'm also reading through the chat messages. Anyone else want to jump in here? Greta? Well, oh, go ahead. I hear someone. Betty Shones never, never shy. <laughs> and <laughs> I'm, I am so uh, privileged to be a vocational rehabilitation counselor specializing in working with our youth. So I've been doing this for 20 years and I love this field. I love these youth. So thank you very much for being here, Dr. Joseph. You are an amazing, amazing speaker and educator. Oh, thank you, Betty. I appreciate that. And you do some wonderful work too on behalf of all our community. So thank you so much. Um, I'm gonna keep reading here. I see Quana from Phoenix, Superpower as being a good friend. Trudy from Billy, hello Trudy, she's from Tuba. That's, I think we went to school together um, and she, her superpower is being a mom. Gail uh, Quackenbush, uh, she's a connector. Casey Coster um, from uh, MI Minnesota. I think it's Minnesota, not Michigan, is it Michigan? You might have to jump in here, Casey. And her superpower is strength. Uh, Zoe uh, from Paige, I believe that her superpower is trying to understand before judging. Uh, Brookie, uh, again, she's from Oklahoma. Seraphine Yazi, hi, Seraphine from Paige. And superpower is being so, a social butterfly. And I think I know Seraphine. Um, hello from Julie, living in Flagstaff. Suzanne from Tucson, Maria from Pueblo, um, Colorado, um, a brain injury advocate and very compassionate. Danielle um, from Durango. So there's a few, uh, many more. Uh, um, and just for the sake of time, I'm going to let you all um, review that with each other. Please reach out to one another, say hello, make some connections today. I think that's one of the most valuable things that we can do in these spaces is to connect on the topic that we're here for today. And that's really to think about the roles of the places we come from. When we think about culture, we think about ceremony, language, history, our home communities. And what does that mean when it intersects with what we know as disability? And so I'm going to move us forward into the next slide. Um, and it would be helpful, Kimberly, or a facilitator to give me a heads up when I have about 10 minutes left because I tend to talk and I don't pay attention to time as well as I should. So that would be helpful. Um, so, so the next question I have for you is thinking about my title, building community. Well, to build a community, we have to know what makes community, right? And so that is my question to you you know, is what is it? What is it that makes community for you? So if you take a moment to think about your understanding, you know, in, in a physical sense where you're at right now, um, to think about maybe multiple communities you've been in, the characteristics of a supportive community, a community where you've had to work a little harder to find that support, so if we can start sharing with each other um, and responding through the chat box, what makes community? Again, I'm going to give you a few minutes um, to respond to that question. What makes community? And, and you can write it as a sentence. You can write it as a simple one-term phrase that lists a characteristic of a community. Um, if you can share with me to. Um, what makes community to you? Okay, we have some coming in. Tanya, Compassionate Connections. Melissa, Unity. Thank you both. Jamie, um, a caring and collaborating, I believe, collaborating community. Welcoming. Personally, community is when people show empathy and respect toward one another and practice. Oh, it's going really fast. For me. Practice active listening. Okay, so thinking a little bit about how we engage, right, in those communities. Values such as caring connections. Hey, from Carol, hello, Carol. Uh, Maria, allowing one to be a whole person. Danielle says, 
uh, community is connecting, accepting all to be inclusive, welcoming, and loving. Um, community is an assemblage of people who work together to benefit others in the area and make life better. Listening, support, collaboration, sharing experiences. So keep them coming in, okay? Um, because what, what's really important is um, I, I want to emphasize, you know, we talk about it a lot in, in academic spaces to think about our positionality. And I talk about this many times with my students who are preparing to be um, educators in the special education field. And we have this topic about culturally responsive schooling, right? And much about that conversation is where our people come from, where our educators come from. And so we have to identify the relationships we have with this context of community. And so I'm, I'm hoping that you, as we're going through this, are making those connections to think about what is community for me? You know, what are the characteristics of that? And, and we're seeing a great list here. So I'm gonna move us on to our next slide and think about that. And here are some of the things that I thought about just generally to, as concepts that I think are important to understand in, in developing this awareness of community. And particularly, I think about this oftentimes when we think about youth. Right, and, and, and one of the things that, that we often talk about when we're learning about these transitions of life, developmental cycles, um, you know, we have many theories in education that tell us the stages of development our youth go through, our children go through. Um, when we talk about youth, typically, you know, we're talking about the, the early teens into the early 20s of youth, and, and that's a very crucial time of development, right? For those who are in K-12 education, we're going through middle school, junior high, and then high school, those transitions are, are um, can be great, but also can be challenging, right? When we're graduating and figuring out those next steps in life, right? What are we going to do? What do we want to do? What are the resources? Right, we, we go back to this understanding of using community to help make those decisions and transition through those spaces. And so I wanna take this concept of thinking about the places we call home, okay? Community in the sense is a place that we call home. You know, for indigenous youth, we understand that there is this continuum of representation that we have indigenous youth who are physically residing in tribal communities, in their federally recognized communities, right? And within that context, we have some that are located near urban communities, such as like here, um, in Arizona, we have the uh, multiple TO tribes, um, Salt River near, near the valley, near Tucson. And then we have tribal communities who are in very rural communities, right? Like my community of youth are living in a very rural area of Arizona. But altogether, these are still places we call home, right? And for youth who are transitioning out of high school, say pursuing a job or higher education and they're moving into a university, into a new town, those places become a place that eventually is called home, right? It can be permanent, it can be temporary. So the idea is to know that we're coming at this from multiple places of diversity. And so I want to keep that in mind as, as we have this conversation today. So again, college, community makes up the, the friends of our community, make up community. So thinking about, you know, who are those friends? Who are those peers that we have relationships with? How does that change over time? Language, 
is such an important component when we talk about really the positionality of indigenous youth, right? We talk about we, the beautiful um, presentation and prayer by Anya, Zoe, um, and I believe it was Kyle, um, thinking about you know, the places they came from and representing those tribal communities through language. Our families, right? Our families are a big component of the community. History. So very oftentimes, history is very integral um, to understanding the formation of community to understand some of the many characteristics that you listed out here in terms of why is our community a loving, giving community, right? Or maybe on the other end, why is our community um, in a place where we need more support to be more loving and caring? To understand that and find the answers to those questions, we have to understand history, right? And so for from an indigenous context, we have, history at a local level, like our cultural history, the stories of um, origin, right, um, related to our individual tribes. But then we have this larger history in relationship to, say, the colonization of the United States, right? So there's this diversity in history as well, right? And, and so how do we understand that? Next thing is ceremony very, very, very crucial, right? No matter where you're at, no matter where those places are that you call home for our indigenous youth, there are ceremonies that are very significant that are protocols for us to follow as we engage in these places that we call home, right? And, and it's, it's indifferent to where those places are in terms of when we go to physically back home or if we're living in a college dorm, right? Or in an urban town for work. We still have these ceremonies that exist and that we practice over time. So these are just a few of the things that I thought of. I know there are many more. And if you wanna to add to this, um, this, uh, PowerPoint slide through comments in the chat box, please do. But the idea here is to say, well, you know, when we see these terms here, we find further that there are these relationships. They're connected, right? They respond to each other. They inform each other, Right. So when we're speaking and working and serving, advocating, self-advocating as Indigenous youth for Indigenous youth with disabilities, we have to understand the context of these relationships. OK, we have to understand that. And so my question is to you, what can you add? You know, what can you add to this? And, and what I would so I'm going to ask you that. It's a prompt for you as our community to say, can you also add whether you're a provider, a parent, or a youth yourself? And then follow that with, what can you add to um, this idea in terms of what other concepts shall we add to the slide that are interrelated that I don't currently have listed? So again, answer the question, what can you add to this slide, but also include, are you a youth? Are you a provider? Are you a parent? Um, let me give you a couple of minutes to do that, and I'll start reading off the comments. What makes community is basically what we're looking at this. Wellness, health and exercise, elder stories, excellent, guidance. Thank you, Melissa. And Trude is a provider and parent. And she says, eh, clan, kinship, excellent. Maria, art, music. Betty says, an old saying is home is where the heart is. And is a mil as a military brat, that was so true since I moved frequently. Brookie says, adding knowledge is important. 
Corrine says family. Steve, who is a provider and parent, says guidance. Guidance is important to add to this. So keep them coming, okay? What makes community? And these are some of the things that we talked about, what the relationships are between them. And, and the idea is to understand how they are relational to each other. Um, and the things that we have to think about as we're providing service, asking or requesting services, right? Carol says seven grandfather teachings. She's a provider, a parent, and a grandmother. Hosea says shared experiences of social relevance and value, passing down traditions. Um, SB says home is our security place. Danielle says provider and parent acceptance and support. So keep them coming, okay? Keep them coming and please respond to each other um, and affirm, you know, by responding to others to say, you know, giving them support and encouragement. Um, that let's keep that conversation going. Um, keep them coming. I'm going to move forward um, to the next slide. So what I'd like to do now is talk a little bit about thinking of these ideas of, um, you know, the four R's, the relationship, responsibility, the reciprocity, and redistribution. So much of what you're listing now, right now, what are the values we can pull from those characteristics when we think about it from an indigenous context, an indigenous lens. And so I thought, you know, let's pull these four R's. And the reason I pulled the four R's is because I participated in a um, early career um, youth leadership program called the Americans for Indian Opportunity Ambassadors Program. Um, through um, LaDonna Harris, uh, and we call her Mama, Mama LaDonna, who is Comanche and the program's operating out of Albuquerque, New Mexico. And part of their framework is to use the far, four R's. And I think it's very generalizable to um, what we're talking about here. And so the first one is relationships. You know, we, we in thinking about relationships, it's the essence that we are all related, right? We have kinship. If we dig deeply into our home communities, the places that we come from, many stories that we draw from there will exemplify this meaning that we are related and we have kinship, right? The rocks outside are living beings. The air we breathe gives us life, right? The water that flows has memory, living memory. And when we talk about kinship, we have clanships in our communities. We relate to each other as mother, brother, uncle, auntie, right? Um, these are prof uh, ways that the profound ways that we are all related. Okay, so understanding that. Um, and how that differs, right, in a Western context. There are some very strong differences when we think about these value systems our youth come from and what we're moving into, right? And relationships is one that is integral for us to understand. The other is responsibility, right? Responsibility, like in, in the sense that we have a responsibility to care for relatives. We have a responsibility to our community. And so there's a value, right? For example, you know, as youth um, are venturing on completing high school and then decide, deciding on those next steps, we hear many times from our indigenous communities the message of, Go get your education, you know, or training, and then come back and do what? Help your people, advocate for your people. So there's this innate sense of responsibility that's very unique to our indigenous youth to care for relatives and care for community. 
Next one is reciprocity. As we think about reciprocity, we're thinking about the reciprocal relationships between the real kinships we have and the responsibilities we have to our relatives and community, right? These two things are related. They're reciprocal to each other. There's an interconnectedness there. And so as we think about this, it's part of our indigenous youth's worldview, right? That as we are making decisions, these values are gonna be part of the decision-making process for youth, right? And so it creates more of like this cause and effect as we strive for a level of balance. And then lastly, we have redistribution. You know, redistribution as the idea of, of sharing resources, maintaining balance, generosity. So as we're traveling and we're thinking about indigenous use making these transitions, particularly when we're thinking about disability, we're learning through this process, right? And so there is a sense of responsibility to remember our relationships, to remember the role of reciprocity, then to redistribute, to give that back to community, right? To find ways to redistribute the tools that we've gathered for ourselves and to give that to community in a collective way, right? Because we come from these communal traditions. And so as we think about that, um, you know, the question I have for you is, now let's take disability. Where does disability fit into all this? You know, if I saw, see, I was reading today that many of you are providers, your parents, your youth, yourself. When we think about understanding the context of disability in, in its many ways, how does it align, rub against the values that we just discussed here? So I'm gonna give you a minute or so to um, think about that and please write your comments in the chat box. I'm happy to have anyone take themselves off mute and share as well. So let, let's, let's jump into that. Where does disability fit into all this? Dr. Joseph, you may not see my raised hand, so I'll oh, just... Oh, I, I don't. I'll just blurt it out. Oh, please do, <laughs> yes. Can you tell me who's speaking? I'm sorry, this is Betty Schoen. Okay, hi, Betty. Hi. My own philosophy is that uh, disability is part of the human experience, that um, any or all of us may have various and sundry different impairments that um, may make things... Um, not always convenient for us, but not create disability. Um, I myself am one of those who has impairments. Um, but as we get older, many of us do acquire um, impairments that become disabling. Um, it's just part of life as a human being. And we have to accept that um, disabilities, even from birth, are, are part of our imperfect human lives because genetics and, and all of that uh, progress and, and get messed up and it happens. So we have to be accepting of all of that and do our best to help that person who has actual disabling conditions help them to live their lives to the fullest. Thank you, Betty. And you're so correct, you know, that it's part of the human experience, right? From birth to um, the stages after life, right? And so I think that's really important to understand the human dimensions of that. Um, is there anyone else that would like to jump in and share? Hi. Um, my name is Esther Cadman, 
Uh, yes. Dr. Esther Cadman, yeah. And I'm actually from, I'm living in Flagstaff right now and uh, working with the Coconino County Educational Service Agency. And um, Dr. Joseph, I, I actually worked with you yes. on the SHARE project or the SHARE <laughs> stuff <laughs> at NAU. So nice. it's good to see you again. Good and, to see you, yes. And, and thank you for this presentation. But I, um, when I'm thinking about disability, because I'm a school psychologist, I'm a trained school psychologist, and um, thinking of disability as far as you know, uh, you know, we we grew up, and even in my profession, we learned of it as being something that's disabling and that that that's you know um, segregates you from you know the people with um, without disabilities and. And it's it's very it's like a the word disability it just it feels like it just um, it's it's separating it's it's segregating it it's you know it's not a term that 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 is in line with all of these um, relationships responsibility so but also I've been learning a lot about my Navajo culture and my Navajo um, traditional beliefs and. I'm learning a lot about that right now. And what I've found out as far as disability goes um, way back when um, pe uh, our people were not thought of as being disabled. You know, they were thought of as um, just, they were just valued the way they are. And if, if it looked different from, you know, um, from the rest of the community, then they just, focused on what that person's strengths were and they they utilized their strengths um, they didn't view them as have as like this disabling person that can't do anything they viewed them as oh you have these strengths here we'll let you you know take the corn husks they're really good at peeling corn husks or they're really good at um they would just find like specific strengths that would be beneficial to to the community because everybody helps, you know, everybody helps when when it's when it's time to gather corn or when it's time to um, build a house for someone or when it's time to, you know, do something to help someone in the community. Everybody had a strength. Everybody had a, a their place in in that in their community, um, you know, tasks or whatever and and so I I just I I want to go back to that and I want to I want to really encourage that thought of people and and not think and think like push them aside or even think of them as someone something different you know mm -hmm. <laughs> someone different yes. because they thank are you. yeah thank you thank you Esther I, I mean that I, exactly um, and I'm very appreciative of you sharing that. I think I agree in the many ways to think about it from a, if we were to start from an indigenous lens to really understand again, digging into the cultural values of our community understandings of human perspective, right? And what I hear Esther saying is that everyone was valued. Right, there was a role and responsibility for everyone in the community. We continue to relate to each other through kinship. Everyone had a role in redistribution and reciprocity. And so if you, if if we all stop to ask the question, is there a term through our many tribes here in the U.S., indigenous tribes and communities throughout the, the world, do we have a term for disability? And more frequently than not, we will find that the answer is no, we do not have a term for disability. And so that goes a long way in speaking about then how do we understand that we are recognizing a system we are engaged in, multiple systems, using the term disability, but also finding ways to create the balance of teaching our youth to develop advocacy, to find their voice so that they can see what we're talking about as strengths and assets. 
to inform their transitional process as they're engaging in these multiple spaces we call home, right? Very, very, very important. And I appreciate the both of you for sharing that, um, your background and input on thinking about how disability fits into this. Um, so, so really to demonstrate that more, I have a couple of stories I wanna share with you. Um, I'm hoping we can fit it in. Um, and if we don't have time for the other slides at the end of this presentation, then, then I can share the PowerPoint with you. Um, but these are two stories. Um, and, and let's pay attention to the roles of the four R's, right? The perspectives of disability. Let's think about their stories in relationship to those transitions in life and decisions they've had to make. What, what, is, what is in their story? Right, where is their voice? So I'm going to start with Ivy Sania. Um, I'm going to stop share and reshare. Okay, so I'm just going to press pause. I mean, press play. So here we go. Uh,
So Ivy leaves us with the question, can you live in my world, right? Um, and at this moment, please feel free to use the chat box, share any themes, concepts, topics that you feel were a highlight of her video um, and paste them in there because we're going to get back to that after the conversation. And now we're going to jump on to um, sharing Cody's story, which I had the opportunity to be part of a um, live Black Feathers podcast um, earlier this week. And he shares his story here. So I want to do that and share that with you. Let's try this again. Extremely powerful. I would like to ask Cody Funmaker if you can answer the same question about storytelling and telling your story and how you have kind of navigated through that and the power of it. I guess um, I'll just kind of talk about my life. Um, I guess how um, I experienced disability, um, um, like through social interaction, um, it started in, like in the elementary. I didn't, I guess I thought like as myself as everyone else, but I did notice that sometimes I'd be separated from the other kids and stuff like that. And I just thought that was a little weird um, at the time. And I remember um, as time went on to um, middle school, I started to um, to get a little bit um, embarrassed about getting the help. Um, it was just kind of like, it's like, well, why am I like not as great as these other kids? Or like, like well, how come they don't need help or anything like that? And I remember um, in kind of in like the Western um, Western society, it's pretty much um, where um, we're independent society. Um, and so um, like it's in that, um, what I mean is that like, it's very much a doggy dog world and it's very much, it kind of, it's a little bit selfish and stuff like that. And so um, so if you like, in the eyes of that, like you would be kind of seen as weak and stuff like that. And I remember I was kind of being, feeling ashamed of getting help because like, um, cause I thought like, oh, um, like that kind of just shows how like dumb you are and stuff like that. And it's like, I remember I didn't want to feel like that. So I started rejecting help from others and stuff like that. I tried to seem, make my seem self, myself seem normal and stuff like that. And so I didn't accept any help. And I also rejected my um, native heritage because um, it was always seen as uncool and stuff like that. I'd see other kids make, other kids making fun of it. And I remember being embarrassed about it. So I remember not wanting to take part of anything. Um, and it just, um, it was very hurtful. Um, and so I guess once high school started hitting around, um, I was still very much in that hurtful um, thinking and stuff like that. And so what happened was like my parents, um, told me about the hotel teaching that like, no, um, no, like you are like everyone, uh, everyone else, but you just need a little bit more help. That's it. Um, like you're not lesser than, than, than everyone else. And you're just like everyone else and you can still contribute. Um, and I remember um, it took me a little bit to get that to my head um, cause um, I'd say it's very hard to get that out of your head, like. Okay, so I'm gonna stop there. Um, I have about five minutes to finish up, um, but I will provide the link for um, that webcast. It's Black Feathers podcast that you can find online. It's also on YouTube um, to follow up with what Cody says. And he finishes his story basically saying that he is now in college. 
um, which he didn't think he could do. Um, but because of community and to support the supports that were available to him, um, he, he finds himself now being in that place. So lastly, let me, let me, um, let me, let me show you the last couple of slides and then we will um, move on on the agenda. So let me just do a screen share here. There we go. Okay, so thinking about that, um, you know, what, what do their stories teach us, right? So if we think about it, they mentioned the places they call home, parents and family, they mentioned topics of self-advocacy, we learned a little bit about resilience, support, culture, normal, this idea of being normal, right? What is that? Um, feelings of being ashamed, um, being separated, the idea of being of separation, um, the role of being indigenous, your heritage, role of communication in multiple formats, right? Um, thinking about the role of ability versus normalcy, um, transitioning, independence, barriers, individualism, so values and differences between cultures of of individualism versus community centrism, resources, limited resources, and goals, and representation, okay? So if we were to organize that a little bit um, and think about this in many different ways, because ultimately, when we talk about identifying ways to incorporate the four Rs, flipping the switch so that we're really approaching this from an asset strength-based approach, we understand that if we don't do a well enough job in supporting youth to do this, it ultimately affects well-being and in many ways, mental well-being, right? Um, and so through the stories itself, we find and could identify that risk factors associated um, were around some of these terms, right? Things that were challenges and barriers for the youth. They also talked about environmental support systems or protective factors. They also mentioned from this how it informed their individual strengths and assets, right? So in doing that, then I take us back to these four R's, right? So if we can figure out ways that support a process that identify the challenges and barriers, identify that macro support system, and then remake those relationships between individual support mechanisms, then integrate the four Rs. We're making it a value-based value -based process, right? And, and in a sense, what we're doing is we're developing resilience. Youth are developing resilience, and that is their superpower, right? It's the superpowers that are being developed. And so, you know, as, as we move on, you know, I want to finish out and close that, you know, it's about building community, building on top of the communities that we have now and finding ways to integrate our multiple communities, being an educator, use what you know and share with others, right? It's that reciprocity redistribution. Use your superpower. Practice the four R's, be a storyteller, and use your voice, right? Because ultimately, the advocacy piece is about in introducing these conversations, especially in our indigenous communities. This community, um, as we think about this ability, more or less ability in an asset-based approach, it is crucially important in serving and contributing to what we know as nation building. Right, creating a nation that is whole and healthy. And our voices from this community are, are very important and integral, integral to that. Returning to a community-based lens using um, and, and to conceptualize inclusion. Right? We talk about inclusion a lot from a, from a practitioner lens of K-12 special education. But what does it mean when we overlap that with an indigenous lens? Everyone's voice and stories have value. Um, and to do all of this, we have to understand that relationality. So lastly, um, I know we don't have time for questions, but here's my contact information. 
Um, in the PowerPoint, which I'm sure will be made available to you, I provided resources for you um, to access the website for three other stories of resilience in addition to um, IVs. Um, my story of resilience, um, the website for the National Technical Assistance Center for Tribal VR, the website for the Native Center for Disabilities, um, reading material um, that might be helpful. Um, and then um, a really up and coming um, organization is the Healthy Native Organization, which is addressing and approaching sexual health um, and ways to engage in conversations um, with youth around sexual health um, provides plenty of resources. And I encourage you to access that um, when you have time available. Um, and so with that, thank you for your time. I appreciate um, your participation in today's presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Joseph. Thank you, Dr. Daryl Joseph. It is essential in indigenous communities to build community based on the four core values of relationships, responsibility, reciprocity, and redistribution. Before we introduce Jim E. Warren, I would like to transition our attention to recognize our tribal youth leaders. The recognition of our leaders are vital to past, present, and future communities. I would like to announce the Jim E. Warren Leadership Awardee for 2023 as Haley Chiarillo. Haley is a member of the Cherokee Nation and currently serves as a feature twirler at Texas Christian University. Haley will now share some remarks. Osio Nagad, Haley Chiriello, Dagodoa, Ale Gijalagi. Hello, everyone, and my name is Haley Chiriello. I'm an enrolled citizen of the Cherokee Nation, and I am incredibly honored to have been named the recipient of this award. Having the support of this community circle means the whole world to me, and it truly fills my heart. My um, journey as a college student, like she said in my bio, I am a student at Texas Christian University. I serve as TCU feature twirler and president of our Native and Indigenous Student Association. And I'm also a local title holder in the Miss Texas organization. But a key part of my identity is my survivor. I am a survivor of emergency brain surgery. Um, during a routine eye exam at the Oklahoma City Indian Clinic, where I've received healthcare all of my life, I was ultimately diagnosed with hydrocephalus following a numerous amount of tests. And the following week, I had emergency brain surgery. This turned my whole world upside down. I suddenly was thrust into a path where I was going to have to learn what it meant to be a survivor of emergency brain surgery, to learn what it meant to navigate life as a hydrocephalus warrior. It was incredibly difficult. I lost the ability to walk. Speaking became incredibly difficult for me. And all of the things that I love to do seemed so impossible and so far away. But as Dr. Joseph was talking about, we have to rely on our superpowers and we have to rely on our community circle to really see growth and to be able to navigate these difficult paths and journeys. And I'm so honored that I had a native circle to rely on during this difficult time. And I hope to use this award to be able to help prepare me for my career in serving Native youth. I'm studying Native American expressions and dance at TCU. So I hope after graduation that I will be able to help empower and inspire the next generation to really pursue and honor the Thank you so much. Yes, thank you, Haley. Um, I would like to introduce Jim E. Warren next. Jim E. Warren is an enrolled member of the Ogallala Sioux Tribe. He is the founder of the American, Indi American Indian Disability Summit. We had just held our 19th summit yesterday. Jim is going to share with you today. Thank you, Jim. Hi, good morning, and thank you so much. I'm glad I can be here to fill in for the other presenter. 
And uh, yesterday was a wonderful day, as you mentioned, our 19th annual Disability Summit for Indian Country. It was a wonderful day, not only because of the events and the people that I got to see and meet, but it was another uh, honoring of Marcus Harrison Jr. Leadership Award, a very good friend of mine, and he was the one to host our talking circle to create the American Indian Disability Summit was our outcome of that talking circle at the Phoenix Indian Health Center in um, downtown Phoenix. So a group of us in our talking circle discuss needs for disability in Indian country. And uh, it was wonderful to be able to be part of that development. And also for Haley, I don't know if Haley's still on, but wonderful. Uh, congratulations on the award. And uh, it's a very big honor for me. I uh, considered the uh, Jimmy Warren uh, award for my father because I'm a junior. So my dad had multiple sclerosis, MS. He had for 37 years, he lived with MS. And he taught me a lot regarding strength, regarding resilience, um, working with his disability in an environment pre-ADA, before the Americans with Disabilities Act. And it's wonderful that he gave me a path to work in the world of disability as more, I get more disabilities as I'm getting older, that's the natural part of the life circle is getting more disabling conditions as you get older. And, um, and again, my wife had a recent onset disability when she was hit by a drunk driver um, at uh, Campo Reservation in, in California. So it was, uh, it was um, wonderful that she survived that head-on collision at 90 miles per hour. But uh, we both, after my heart attacks and heart surgery, uh, as I said, we're getting older. Um, uh, you learn to see life differently in terms of every day is a bonus, I always say. You know, even if it's a quote unquote bad day, there was something in that day that gave you more strength, resilience. Those challenges make us stronger. And uh, again, the challenges of living with a disability in today's society is still not easy because ADA can only do so much with inclusion and protections for people with disabilities. But as we see with examples like Haley and other young people like Mateo that I saw yesterday and Anya, who is wonderful as well, they're both working with our transition program at uh, Arizona Sonoran Center for Excellence and Disabilities. So they're part of our team under the umbrella of the new circle of indigenous empowerment. And we like that because it, the circle identifies um, partnership. We're in that circle, that council fire, if you will, uh, from a traditional perspective. And that talking circle format is inclusive, bringing in community members, bringing in our young people with disabilities. We're always wanting your input because you're the ones that know what your needs are. So it's, uh, you know, it's not us, uh, up to us in terms of determining your needs, it's up to you to share. And we want you to have that empowerment as indigenous youth to share and tell your stories so that other youth can benefit as well, knowing that they're not alone dealing with a lot of these challenges. So again, uh, I'm representing my father, Jim Sr. I'm here in uh, Tempe, Arizona at my parents' house. My father made his journey uh, years ago but my mom uh, still uh, lives here in Tempe as well as in South Dakota where she is uh, teaching. So it's wonderful to be able to um, uh, be able to represent my family as best I can in the world of disability and Indian country. So I feel that both of our cultures, the disability culture with all of our different disabilities, the diversity of disabilities in the disability culture, as well as the uh, Indian culture and all the different tribes within the Indian culture. So it's very diverse, both cultures and our cultures tend to intersect 
a lot. Over the years, I've seen the similarities of our cultures as particularly indigenous people with disabilities, we're dealing with two sets of uh, challenges to be included, to be heard. Many times in Congress or in business or schools even, they will forget Indian issues or disability issues. Uh, when they bring up uh, diversity even, sometimes they don't even bring up our issues as indigenous students or professionals or just people. So again, uh, your voice is being heard and it's uh, a good deal that we're able to have you included and hearing your voice is very important for us. So if you have any questions, please uh, please share in, uh, in the chat or uh, we'll have a Q&A at the end of my presentation as well. Um, am I able to show my screen yet? Uh -uh. Let's see here. Oh, good. Let's see if I get the right one here. Um, I'd like to share a film that I made for uh, Fox. Whoops, let me, I think that's the wrong one. Let's see here. Yes. Um, new share, there we go. Sorry about that. I need a teenager for my <laughs> technology skills. Uh, let's see here, stop share. I'll try again, sorry about that. <clears throat> Okay, here's a short that I did for Fox Sports. Um, for those that don't know, I uh, was drafted by the Cincinnati Bengals after the Rose Bowl championship at Arizona State. So uh, it was a wonderful year for me where we started off New Year's with a Rose Bowl championship and then I was drafted by Cincinnati Bengals. And then I graduated from Arizona State with my bachelor's that same year. So it was uh, a great year for me personally. and. Uh, here, if I can share the screen, I'll just do try to enlarge it. But this is a, a film that I co-produced with Fox Sports for Social Justice, addressing the mascot issue, but I kind of went into uh, more issues of for Indian country. So I hope you enjoy. <clears throat> Are you able to hear that on volume? Yes. I never did play for a team with a native mascot, but I played against teams with native mascots. So obviously I was a target of people that wanted to say things like scalp the Indian or cut your hair. When we hear that term red skin, we know that it's a term of our pelts, our scalps, that were bounties that were paid to bounty hunters. This negative imagery is getting most of the press, yet there's deeper issues in Indian country. We learn a lot about genocide in other countries, but we don't learn about the genocide that happened here. Back in 1890, the 7th Cavalry really wanted to get us back for Custer's Last Stand. When you look at the Wounded Knee grave site, my family is number 18 on that list of families that perished that day. <laughs> Being an American citizen, many of us don't have that experience of visiting a mass grave, of feeling that trauma from many generations ago. Pine Ridge, my home reservation, is the poorest county in the United States. So the average family income is under $10,000 per year. Unfortunately, Indian country has the highest rate of COVID-19 in the world. And when I go home and I hear the people that are passing away just because they can't keep themselves warm, that's something that's very challenging. When you think of Paha Sapa, which means Black Hills, that's our sacred land. U.S. policy saw that our culture, our ceremonies were savage and heathen. 
So we could have been singing a song for happy birthday or a wedding, and they saw it as war drums. Black Ops said it would take seven generations to heal our circle after Wounded Knee. So as we gather on this special holiday, let's give thanks for inclusion. Let's give thanks for culture. Let's give thanks for who we are as two legates. Well, uh, that was wonderful to be able to uh, be featured on Fox Sports on Thanksgiving Day for the NFL pregame show. So 33 million people saw that piece on Thanksgiving Day. And then they re-aired re it on Fox Voices on Martin Luther King Day, which uh, was um, seen by 6 million more people. And it was about athlete advocates. So uh, a lot of times we have a platform that we can utilize to share our stories. And uh, my platform as a former professional football player, as an educator, as an advocate and a filmmaker, I was able to uh, co-produce and write that piece for Fox Sports and working with Mark Wahlberg, or not Wahlberg, <laughs> uh, uh, Ruberg. And he, it was wonderful to work with the producers at Fox. Uh, uh, Mark actually texted me this morning and he saw a piece on lacrosse and it featured one of the Thompson brothers uh, who are famous lacrosse players. They're some of the best lacrosse players in the history of the game and they're out there playing now. So it's wonderful to see that long hair coming out of their helmet. Like in my day, I was one of the first with long hair in professional football. So Sports Illustrated did a feature on me called Urban Indian and it uh, showed me with my hair down and my pads. And so it was a big deal to have long hair back in 1992, I believe it was, uh, when they did that article. Um, it may have been 1991, but a long time ago anyway. But today you see a lot of long hair from various cultures, and it's now more accepted. So it's good to see that, you know, particularly for Indian country, we can keep our long hair if we choose to do so. And uh, even Mateo yesterday at the uh, at the uh, disability summit, he was there supporting his mom who won this year's Marcus Harrison Award. So we we're very proud to honor her with that award uh, for the work that she does in Indian country for special education and advocacy and supporting our young people with disabilities. So again, it's a um, it's really a, a great honor to be able to work back in Arizona again. Uh, through uh, the Sonoran Center of Disabilities, I'm able to work part-time with them as an administrative affiliate and uh, hiring Native people to uh, work in Indian country for Arizona disability issues. So it's been a, a great experience for me to be able to do that and have that opportunity to um, create new programs through grant writing and program development. Um, I think that I really enjoy uh, creating programs through storytelling. And it's uh, been wonderful to be able to share stories and teach through film. Essentially, I'm instead of teaching in a lecture hall or a classroom, I'm able to teach through film and share my stories uh, with uh, various audiences. For instance, later this afternoon, my current film, Remember the Children, will be airing at the Phoenix Film Festival at the Harkins Cinemas on Scottsdale Road and 101 Freeway. So today, uh, tomorrow and Tuesday, I'll be sharing my current film, Remember the Children, that I showed yesterday 
regarding the boarding school history and what happened to our kids in the boarding schools many years ago. So uh, that's something that is uh, another great honor for me to wear many hats professionally as an academic, like today, right now I'm an academic, and then now I'm gonna put my producer hat on and then go to the film festival and uh, support our screening and do a producer Q and A after our screening today at the film festival. So it's great to be able to live my dream. And that's what I want for all of you young people is what is your dream? Never stop dreaming because I'm still dreaming at 58 years old. You know, I'm hoping that I still win an Academy Award someday. You know, you never know. It would be wonderful to uh, be up there and represent not only myself, but my family and my people, the Oyate. And all indigenous people would be represented if that happened. So it may not be me, it might be one of you, because all of you can be filmmakers. If you have a cell phone with a camera, you can be a filmmaker these days. So I always encourage in my film camps for our young ones to interview your grandparents or your elders now. Get their story so that you have that ability to not only practice filmmaking, but you're gonna get an archive of family history. I'm so happy I interviewed my grandma. I just missed interviewing my dad. We had it planned to interview him at, during Christmas, but he passed away the day before Christmas. So uh, again, you don't wanna wait. So you wanna get out there and get those stories recorded Fortunately, I have a lot of those stories in my head from my dad, but it would be wonderful to have them on tape telling those stories like with my mom and with grandma and with other family members that I want to get family archives. And it's very easy to do these days with your cell phone. So also, if you want to practice uh, filmmaking, just go out there and put a bunch of B-roll, we call it. B-roll is kind of background roll. Uh, when you see people talking on film and then there's a background of a scene like a reservation, we see a scene of the res, you know, maybe driving through the res and somebody is talking, narrating, you know, something that um, they makes you feel like you're traveling with that person uh, when they're telling their story and they're not even in the car, but it gives you the viewer that sense that they're part of that story through vision of the film and then of course the narration is very important and more and more these days we have native filmmakers and uh, writers and editors and just people in the industry more than ever before and uh, i've been saying for 30 years in my lectures that uh, we as uh, native people have made it in american culture if we are a sitcom now we have a situation comedy, Res Dogs, Reservation Dogs. How many watch that show? It's so awesome to see our people telling our stories. And now America is laughing with us. They're not laughing at us. So uh, they're winning awards and doing very well. But not only with the success of the show and those young actors, those kids from the Res representing our people in a good way, but they're being honored for their work, but they're also representing their people, their family, their Oyate, their, their tribe. So it's wonderful that to see the young filmmakers out there and more and more of our work is being out there. I'm even considering getting back into acting. I, re, I quit acting years ago because of the stereotypes in Hollywood that I would have to portray in my young years. If you Google me and put stuntman or something, you'll see some of my work in Hollywood with a lot of the fight scenes we did. Uh, we got Cinemax fight of the month for the substitute, me and Tom Berenger. Uh, and that was cool because it helped pay for my master's degree. So <laughs> I kind of used Hollywood uh, and uh, those uh, payments to do some films and stunt work to help me with my master's degree from San Diego State University. So um, again, with utilizing my dream jobs and uh, going after my education that uh, gave me another dream job and what I'm doing now, uh, working in disabilities at the, um, with Arizona tribes and then back with the Oyate Circle, 
uh, I'm almost able to get uh, to work with my people in South Dakota. So let me see if I can share my screen again successfully. <clears throat> Okay, hopefully you can see that okay. And um, uh, here's, uh, yeah, that's good. All right, thank you very much. So uh, again, uh, I was showing uh, Remember the Children yesterday at our conference and uh, um, it's very intense in terms of the stories of what happened to our kids. And this uh, Remember the Children, my film was about the rapid- Going back up. Oh, I just took pain. I'm sorry, what's wrong? Is everybody able to see my screen? I'm just making sure. Yep, I think we're good. Thank you. Oh, good. Okay. Uh, so again, with the film, um, it tells the history of boarding schools. And then with this particular film was about the Rapid City Indian Boarding School, where they identified 50 children that died at the Rapid City Boarding School. So now we're uh, sharing their names. We're gonna make a memorial to honor those kids so they're not forgotten. And I wanna share a little bit about my family. Here is uh, from the Library of Congress, a piece where Red Cloud uh, visited the White House with other Lakota leaders. And you see here, it happened at the White House in Washington, DC in 1872. And my grandpa Stabber was one of those leaders and there he is with Red Cloud. So it's pretty cool to be able to see pictures of grandpa representing in a good way as a leader uh, with Red Cloud and working with President Grant uh, for negotiating peace in those days. So this is his headstone and he lived to be 70 years old. So uh, he had a long life. And uh, unfortunately, the average age of death for Indian men today on Pine Ridge Reservation, my home is 50, I mean, sorry, 48 years old. So that is a public health crisis. When you think of the death rate is under 50 years old for Indian men on Pine Ridge. Nationally, it's 57 years old. So that is still significantly lower than other cultures in the United States. So we need to do something about that collectively. And some of you are gonna choose uh, professions and a life where you're gonna be making a difference for future generations, addressing disability and public health issues. So think about those things uh, in your future uh, because we need your young minds out there to impact future development of new ways of serving our people in Indian country and addressing disability. So uh, here's my other grandpa, kills on horseback. And I'm named after him. Tashunka Akonhwachakte is my name in Lakota. And kills on horseback would sing every day. My mom grew up on Pine Ridge Reservation without any plumbing or electricity, none of that. But uh, he would sing every morning and every day at night at sunset. He would sing prayer songs and story songs. And mom grew up with that. So she heard it in her language. She heard it from her cultural context through storytelling and song. She heard those prayers, that spirituality of our people every day as a kid. So she knew who she is. She knew who she is as a result of Grandpa Stabber and growing up that way on Pine Ridge. Here's Unchi, Grandma Featherman. And she's holding an infant here. And uh, you can see uh, that they're in full regalia celebrating that young person. But unfortunately, that baby passed away. And uh, many babies are still passing away today at young ages. So you young people are really living in an environment of challenge. You should be very proud of yourselves that you're here today uh, learning and joining us and sharing your stories because you are doing something, you know, other than wasting your time sitting on the couch or watching TV or whatever, you're here getting better. And that's what I'm very proud of is seeing so many young people join us today 
and wanting to not only learn, but to teach us, older people, what your needs are. So again, we need to hear your voices so we can address some of these challenges in Indian country. Here's my parents when they got married in 1962. And my mom and dad, that was a happy day for them. But the reality was after that wedding day, mom wasn't allowed to live in housing yet in Rapid City. There were still no Indians allowed signs in stores and restaurants. So uh, that's why I grew up in Arizona because fortunately here in Phoenix and Tempe, uh, Indians were allowed to live in houses in, uh, in 1962. So I grew up in Arizona, but I always went home to Pine Ridge. And here's my uh, Unchi and Lala, my grandma and grandpa, Louie and Eva. And that's my mom's parents. So uh, uh, there's me as a baby. As you can see, I was a big oversized baby, but uh, <laughs> I'm sure grandpa's going, hurry up, take the picture, he's heavy, hey. But uh, again, it's wonderful to have these pictures and history and knowing who I am through these pictures and stories. And that's what I want you to do is know who you are as a native person and know what your family history is. That's why I'm encouraging you to get those videos, which you will value very much uh, hearing from your unchis and lalas, your grandma and grandpas. Uh, so that you can get those stories for your kids someday. Here's my home, Pine Ridge. Uh, this is the res just right off of uh, the Black Hills. And uh, the Kyle is the village mom grew up in. And then that other circle is Wounded Knee. Uh, I have family buried in that mass grave of 300 people. So three of my family members are buried in that mass grave that I go visit every time I go home. I uh, go by and uh, honor uh, my relatives and let them know they're not forgotten. So that's another thing to know our history and know who we are is to also know those stories that are difficult uh, in terms of some of the challenges that we dealt with historically, as well as the challenges that we're dealing with today. So here's the school where my mom went, uh, Pine Ridge uh, Boarding School in the 1940s. And in those days, it was legal for uh, uh, these schools to literally take these kids from the families and force them to the boarding schools. So they were essentially kidnapped and forced into the boarding schools because of government policy. And in these schools, they were designed to take the Indian out of the child. And that meant to force them to be American and not indigenous. So here you see the picture of a camp of families that made camp near the school so that they could at least see their kids from a distance. And that was a hard time uh, for my mom uh, in those days with a weekly kerosene head wash where they thought uh, we were just dirty people. So they forced every child to get a kerosene head wash every Wednesday night. And my mom remembers that at 83 years old when that happened to her. So those are some of the traumatic effects from the history of many what our people went through. And here is Indian camp in Rapid City. And this is where my mom lived so that they could go to school in Rapid City. Um, her parents decided that the kids needed to go to school in the city off the reservation. And so they lived here uh, in Indian camp because I remember they couldn't live in houses yet. So we had a, there were hundreds of these tents and wooden structures in what was called Oshkosh camp back then. But she remembers this, even though it was, you know, kind of a refugee camp, it looked pitiful, but as a community, a Teoshpae, it was a good place because it was all Lakota people. So it was again, kind of a community in Rapid City that was all Lakota, where people could live in tents and work in the lumber yards, or like my mom did, she washed dishes uh, when she was nine years old, she washed dishes at a restaurant so that she could help her family earning money. So this is where they lived back in those days because uh, again, we couldn't live in houses yet until the Civil Rights Act came 
later. <clears throat> and here's my mom. I'm so proud of mom. I'm a mama's boy, I admit it. <laughs> At 58, I still am. And I'm very lucky I still have my mom. And particularly uh, her leadership, not only for our family, but for Indian country. There she is 60 years ago uh, when she got her nursing degree. And then 60 years later, she's holding that picture of herself uh, on those same steps where she went to school, 60 years. So that's wonderful. She's still working at South Dakota State University Nursing. And she's increased the Indian nurses by 10 times. They used to only have four nurses before she arrived. Now they have over 40 nurses and five nurses graduated last semester. One of those graduates is here now working at Phoenix Indian Health. So it's really cool that mom is still impacting education and nursing. And there's gonna be many future generations of nurses serving Indian country because of the opportunity that she gave them to thrive and succeed instead of drop out and uh, not be able to pass their classes. They have a great support system where she helps indigenize the process of curriculum. So again, there's the Oyate Circle in South Dakota. And this is a program I developed uh, with Wendy Parent Johnson, who is the director of the current Sonoran Center in Arizona. She was the director of the Disability Center in South Dakota at the School of Medicine, where we teamed up and I wrote a bunch of grants and contracts and we got the funding to create Oyate Circle. And uh, Wayne, my Tahanshi, he's a relative of mine. He is the director of the program and he runs our program for the Oyate Circle. And Oyate stands for people in the Lakota language. So it's nice to use our own language in our programs at the University of South Dakota School of Medicine. And there's the nine uh, reservations of what's left of what was the Great Sioux Nation is what it's called. And it's the Ocheti Shakoe, which means uh, seven council fires. And uh, again, I apologize to our interpreter, you're doing great with my Lakota language. So uh, thank you, Palamia, thank you. And uh, again, this is our Indian land. We have what's left in South Dakota which is significant in terms of land base, but we're only 11% of the population in South Dakota. In uh, Arizona now we have the Circle of Indigenous Empowerment and that's designed on the Oyate Circle model in South Dakota, but designed for Indian country in Arizona because we're very different as Indian people. So it's uh, designed to address the needs of the indigenous I'm giving Jim a text right now. Let's give him a couple minutes to log back in. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, are you able to hear me? Yes. Oh, good. I've uh, my power went out, so I'm glad I'm back. Um, again, I only have a few minutes left. Um, if you could uh, just uh, enable me to share my screen one more time, I would appreciate it. <clears throat> But uh, in closing, I have 10 more minutes and just want to share with you just a few more things uh, regarding some of the things that are happening in the Indian country. And uh, again, I'm very proud of the, what we're doing with Circle of uh, Indigenous Empowerment and having that opportunity to create a program that makes a difference for Indian country. Uh, so it's wonderful to um, write these grants uh, from, South, or from uh, San Diego because I live in San Diego on Mission Bay. And it's a, a dream of mine to live near the ocean. So I always say I must have been a whale back when the Badlands was still an ocean near our country, because I love the water. And uh, playing with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, uh, I really enjoyed living on the bay there. So that's why I chose to live in San Diego in my uh, post football career. And that's why I went to school in San Diego and uh, worked in disability programs there for many years. And now um, I'm working with the Arizona program and the South Dakota programs, but still live in San Diego. So uh, here's Indian country. You're well aware of Indian country in Arizona. 
uh, your population, is, I believe, is 3% of Arizona, but 26% uh, of the land base. So always remember the power you have as Indian people in terms of impacting vote turnout. I know that when we have a high turnout in Indian country in Arizona, that can swing votes. And I'm not a member of a party. I'm an independent and I vote for whoever does the best for Indian country. So that's what I suggest is find who works best for Indian country. And in Arizona, historically, it was Senator McCain who did a lot of good things for Indian country. Uh, we need to find more of those people. And hopefully someday it's one of you that runs for Congress and you'll represent our tribes in a good way. And in closing with my PowerPoint here, I just wanna you know, remind us of how diverse we are as indigenous people. We still have over 200 languages out there today. And uh, again, we are very diverse as indigenous people in America. And uh, when someone says, hey, do you speak Indian? And when I'm traveling in an airport or something, They'll say, do you speak Indian? And I go, I don't know. Do you speak European or do you speak Asian? You know, again, I speak Lakota. Some of you speak your languages and it's never too late. I still am not fluent in Lakota, but at least I am still learning so that my grandchildren will hear Takoja. They know that's them as grandchildren. Hokshila is boy, Wichinchila is girl. You know, those are the things I want my young ones to hear is our language. And I feel that's very important. And uh, I wanna close with, let me see here. Let's see if I can do it good. <clears throat> the ending of my film, uh, Seventh Generation, and let's see, oh, it's not coming up. Maybe it will. Hopefully uh, you see that. Oops, wrong film. This is my film, uh, Remember the Children. Sorry about that. Well, we'll skip that ending anyway. Um, you can go to warrior-society.com and I'll share that on the chat so you can look up some of my films and some of the work that I do in Indian country, both in the world of disability, as well as the film industry. So uh, again, uh, I'll take some time for any questions or comments, or if anyone wants to share their stories that maybe share their dream of what they wanna do someday. Maybe I'll be one of those elder actors working for you as a film producer someday or a director. So Palamia Washte, thank you so much for your time. <clears throat> we can open up this time for any questions or comments or stories or anything that you'd like to ask Jim right now while we have his presence with us. And thank you, Jimmy, for joining us today and congratulations on your film showing. Um, we mm. hope to make it out there. Really excited to see what's going on out there. Thank you. Good luck at that Phoenix Film Fest. Yes. Oh, someone's asking. Yes, it's the Harkins 101 off Scottsdale Road and the 101 freeway. So today is at uh, 3.50 p.m. Tomorrow is 11.30 a.m. And on uh, Tuesday, it is at 2.30 p.m. So we have three showings of Native American directed short films. Maybe one of you will be one of those someday. <laughs> Any questions? Let me see anything on here. Oh, thank you, Haley. Uh, again, I'm so proud of you and the work you're doing. And uh, I'm very glad that you were able to get this award. So thanks for representing the Cherokee people in a good way. <laughs> Let me see. Oh, thank you, uh, Daryl. It's always wonderful to work with you and hear your work and what you're doing for the people and other generations. So thank you so much for being with us today. Hey, Jim, I have a question. Uh -huh. Are there any plans to um, go into politics? Hey. Oh, gee. <laughs> My wife is on her tribal council, so no. Hey. <laughs> Uh, she'll, she can be a leader in the political world, you know, so 
Uh, maybe she'll be president someday and I can be the first man. Hey. Absolutely. <laughs> Hi, Mr. Warren. I wanted to thank you so much. I'm I'm so honored to be the award recipient. And right now where I am on campus, I'm standing in a place where my culture is very unfamiliar and I'm doing my best to stay standing on campus to still keep representing. And so your example is so inspiring. I was wondering, I serve on the DEI committee at TCU. How can I get your films for screening on campus? I think this is really needed and powerful. Oh, yeah. Contact me through or my email is warriorfoundation at gmail. And then on my website, you can contact me and then I can send them uh, information. I've done a few film festivals or screenings of individual films. Uh, we did all three or four of my films. I've uh, produced four films. So it varies whatever your needs are. I can uh, help out there. and. Uh, even though you beat my Sun Devils in the tournament, hey. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness, yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> but again, I'm very proud of you and representing, and you know, my uh, wife's Lakota name is woman who stands ahead or in front as a leader. And uh, you're a young person representing that philosophy in a good way. And just representing not only your people, but all indigenous people in a good way. And as well as the disability culture. So keep up the good work, young lady. I'm looking forward to your future endeavors and the impact you'll make. <clears throat> Thank you so much. Hey, someone's gonna be the first indigenous president. I like that. Who is that, Betty? Yes, all right. That's what the way I want you to think. You know, dream big, why not? You know, my biggest dream was I wanted to be a all pro NFL player and then a, a great actor in Hollywood with. Uh, Academy Awards, but I didn't become an all pro football player, but I still made professional football. So, you know, even though I didn't make my ultimate goal, I still improved significantly in terms of achieving at a high level. I haven't won my Academy Award yet. <laughs> I'm still working on that, but I'm still dreaming. So again, keep those dreams going. Never stop dreaming. So <clears throat> last, I have a question, Jim. Could you uh, share with us the name of the movie that you were in? Um, uh, oh, as a stuntman or as, yeah. Uh, oh yes, uh, my biggest film is The Substitute with Tom Berenger. That was, geez, in 1996, but we got fight scene of the month on Cinemax and, uh, to tell the truth, I accidentally hit him and knocked him out. Oh, no. uh, so, uh, I guess I'm a method actor. I was joking <laughs> with him after that, but, uh, the producers weren't happy because he had to miss two days of shooting. And if the star is not working, then the whole uh, film set, the film crew gets the day off. So <laughs> everyone was going, hey, thanks for the vacation when I came back to do my final scene on that film. But yeah, the substitute, they made four of them. So I'm in the first one. And uh, I didn't make the two, three or four because uh, unfortunately, I don't make it through the first film. <laughs> so spoiler alert, you know, I, you know, I'm one of the bad guys that perishes in that film. But that was fun living my dream as a young person uh, in my 20s doing uh, the acting and film work that I dreamed about and, and then getting fight scene of the month and just having that experience was awesome. Yet it was frustrating because as a person that knew who I was as an indigenous person, as an Indian man, it was frustrating the Hollywood parts that I would have to deal with. Even with Adam Sandler, I'm sure all of you know who Adam Sandler is when I was auditioning uh, for a part at Sony Pictures at the studios, uh, he came up to me and said, I need you to sound more foreign. And I go, oh no, Adam, you want a Hollywood stereotype Indian? Is that what you want? Of course, I didn't get that part as a result of not wanting to portray the Hollywood stereotype that Adam wanted in that film. So again, it's getting better now. They still have stereotyped roles for us, but again, there's more of us behind the camera as producers and writers and directors to impact that story with our lens as indigenous people. So keep dreaming and tell your stories. <clears throat> Wopila. Hmm. But thank you everybody for what you're doing. You're making a difference. Again, it's the 
whatever footprints or wheel prints or cane print or prosthetic prints, whatever print that you happen to make, just keep making those prints for future generations. So, oh, website, I will share my website. Okay. So thank you so much for your time today. Oh, mitakuye oyachin. Palamia. Mm. Pashtelo. <clears throat> it's warrior-society.com, but I'll put it in the chat real quick. So yes, uh, check out my films. And hopefully if you're in Phoenix uh, tomorrow, or today, tomorrow, or Tuesday, come by our screening. And my mom's my star, so you'll see my mom uh, in the film as well. So <clears throat> any other questions, comments? Oh, good. Someone shared my website as well. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Well, again, well done today. Good job. <laughs> I really appreciate the everything that you do, young ones. You're our future. And I'm very proud of the what you're going to do. So you on the screen, though. Your screen's not on. Thank you very much, Mr. Warren. We are gonna move on to Mr. Hosky Benali. Mr. Hosky Benali Jr. is a member of the Navajo Nation and is legally blind. He resides in Shiprock, New Mexico and is a graduate of Brigham Young University with a bachelor's of science degree in sociology. He's here as a representative of the Native American Disability Law Center. I'd just like to thank uh... The presenters this morning, um, Mr. Joseph and also uh, Mr. Warren, for the words of wisdom and encouraging our young people um, with disabilities. Uh, I'm Hosky Benali Jr. and I'm Navajo. I'm from uh, Shiprock, New Mexico, and currently working with the Native American Disability Law Center out of Farmington. Uh, and what we do there is we provide um, referrals, education, and free legal services to families and and individuals with disabilities who feel like they've been discriminated against. And so the other thing is that um, we also do a lot of uh, education. And so I'm also the president of Navajo Nation Advisory Council on Disabilities with the Navajo Nation. And that advisory council is part of the Navajo Nation under Title 13 of the Navajo Nation Code, and that's to identify service gaps of what Navajo disabilities are experiencing, and then to provide um, suggestions and uh, for the Navajo Nation as far as uh, legislation to um, remedy those gaps. And just recently was appointed by President Biden as uh, a member, council member of the National Con Council on Disabilities. So um, <clears throat> I'm, I'm legally blind, like they say. Um, and I um, became blind in, uh, when I was 22 years of age from retinitis dyspigmentosa. Of course, I had, um, I was born that way. And in my younger days, I had night blindness, which is part of RP. And um, so I still could see outside when I go out and outdoors, I could read, even could drive, did a lot of sports, outdoor basketball, football. But when I uh, got into high school, I wanted to play basketball, but I couldn't because the, the gyms were too dim for me and then a lot of the football games were at night so I, I couldn't keep up with it with because of my uh, disability but still played a lot with my uh, my brothers and other relatives so in 20 when I reached 22 years of age I was married at about six months and I lost a lot of my vision in a matter of two weeks for I couldn't read anymore, I couldn't drive, I couldn't recognize people's faces. And so went through um, a lot of um, adversities, a lot of challenges. And so <clears throat> that takes me to where I'm at today, which is uh, advocating for 
our Native youth, our Native people with disabilities, uh, being an advocate for them. And that's where this journey has taken me. And so in our Navajo tradition, uh, we have a story that's called Early Dawn Boy Story. And it's about our, how we look at disabilities and the story about who we really are as individuals. And the story goes that way back then, um, there was a number of um, young people with disabilities in the community. And um, for one reason or another, their um, parents, their family um, felt like they were a hindrance to them, that they couldn't go where they wanted to go, do what they wanted to do because they were at this stay home or always take their child with a disability with them to wherever whatever events that they were going to. So they decided to put them in one place, all, all these children with disabilities, and they put them near a family that had a big hole gone. And so they built uh, like with, uh, with, with brush and trees around circle. And, and then they, they put these, these children in there with disabilities in, in, in that place there. And that family that lived nearby there was just a keeping an eye on them. And so every day their families would bring food by and just put it outside, bring water by, put their bedding, um, bring some bedding for them. And so th these young children started to learn how to take care of each other. And those that were able to walk went out and, and brought the food in for the others. And those that were able to use their hands and, and uh, they were taking care of the fire at night, building the fire so that all the children could be warm. But as time passed, it just, it, it just continued to do that. And the children were just basically just taking care of themselves. And that family next door would just look over there and make sure that everybody was okay. Until one day along the way, a young man appeared there. And that family noticed that that young boy, a teenage boy, was taking care of those children. So they didn't think anything about it, just that this young man, he's taking care of them now, so we don't really have to look over there. And this young man was doing what the children were doing for themselves. And he, he would um, go out and get the food, go in and uh, build a fire. And then he would uh, help those to, that wouldn't feed themselves. He would feed them. And then he would fix their bedding for them. And uh, he would wash their faces for them. And this went on for a time. One day they came out of that place and the, uh, he was helping them along, those that couldn't walk. He helped them, he carried them a certain distance and he went back got another one. And he got another one that was able to walk but was weak and took him to a certain distance. And then he kept them all together like that. And they went into the east direction and they went over the hill and they were there all day. In the evening time, they came back and they were covered with white clay. They've been playing in clay. And so they went back into that dwelling again. And uh, he then washed them and put, put their bedding out for them, fed them, uh, make sure that it was warm. And then the next day they came out again. This time they went south and went over the hill again. And that evening he, we brought him back and they were coming back. He was helping all of them again, one by one, very patient with them, very caring for them. And they went back into that dwelling. <clears throat> and this time they came back and they had, they had blue clay on them. So the next day, the same thing, they came out of that um, dwelling again. And they, this time they went west and they went around that family where the, their Hogan was. And they went on to the south of that and then they went in this direction. And that's what he was doing again, carrying some, 
was helping some of the others, and others were helping each other. <clears throat> then they went in the west direction and they went over the hill again. So they came back that evening again and they made sure everything was okay for each one of them. Fourth day, they came out again and they went around that Hogan on the south side. And one of the younger boys, um, and you know how uh, traditional Hogans are with Navajo people, they usually put a blanket in there. One of the little boys, he opened that blanket, pulled that blanket back, and he looked in there, and that family was eating breakfast. And the, one of the men said, Go on, you don't belong in here. And so he just closed the, the door and and then he went around and they went north this time. And they were hearing each other again, following each other. The little boy was helping them. In time, he was joking with them, laughing with them. And then that family said, wonder what they're doing. First day they went east, second day they went south. Last day, yesterday they went west, now they're going north. And so they told one of the men folk, Go follow them and see what they're doing. So one of the men went, went out and started following them, was hiding so they wouldn't see him. And they went down and washed and came up on the other side. And they traveled north to a place where there was a pond of water. And so <clears throat> that man just standing behind the trees and watching them. And they were all along this pond of water with this young man. And they were all sitting down and they were playing in, in the mud and um, making, making different objects, things like that. And he was just watching them. And then uh, this pond of water across, across the way, it was like a, like a forest. And that man looked across there. He saw, noticed something moving. And when he looked over there, he saw four four beings they weren't exactly human beings, but they were four beings. They had feathers on their head. And they were, <clears throat> they were like, in, not invisible, but like transparent. And they came across that pond of water and, and they floated across and they got to those children. And those children were, noticed them and wasn't, they weren't even scared of them. And then they start carrying those children one by one, picking them up, hugging them. And, um, and they went to this young man that was taking care of them. And they did the same thing. They hugged them and thanked them. And um, then they were sitting down with them and they were making these objects with, 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 them, with the, the mud and the clay. And then a cloud started to come down and went down to where they were at. I guess you would say like a magic carpet. And when the cloud came down, these uh, spiritual beings started to take these children onto that cloud with that young man. And they said that that cloud, when it came down, it had some real strong energy to it. And, and that man that was standing behind that tree, hiding, watching, he said it, it, um, it threw him over. And he knew it was something then that's spiritual, something that's got um, a lot of force to it. And so that cloud lifted up with these children and, and that young man and these three spiritual, four spiritual beings that rose up into the sky and he looked after it, he yelled after it. And that cloud left and it went east till it disappeared. And that young man, that man that had followed them was looking wondering what had happened it scared him at the same time so he ran back to the hogan and he told the people the hogan our children are gone they're gone they, they were taken were taken away by four spiritual beings a cloud came by and they got onto that cloud and they disappeared and everybody ran out of the hogan the word got around the community Everybody ran to where the um, pond was, where these children were playing at. And uh, these 
their family members, the moms and dads of those children that were in the, that dwelling there. They were there, they all ran over there and looked down when they got to that pond and they were perfectly made objects where, um, that we use uh, in ceremonies. There was pipes, there was bowls that we use for our medicine. There was uh, horses, little horses, sheep, cows, that we put in our uh, medicine pouches as Navajo people with our corn pollen. And they were perfectly made. And these uh, the family members, the moms and the dads, they were picking up these objects. They were crying, saying, wonder what happened. So they took all these objects back and, and we used for their ceremonies. So they hired uh, a medicine person that, that does uh, crystal gazing. And they wanted to know what happened to the children. So that evening, that medicine person came and he used his crystals and told these family members, he said, you're the ones that caused it. That what you did to them isn't, wasn't a thing to do because of, it, because of your own laziness, because of your lack of compassion. So these holy beings took them back and they're not gonna come back to you. And so he told them that it's early in the morning. He said, tomorrow morning, he's gonna hear a bird chirping. And this bird chirping is gonna give you a message. So they all stayed in that Hogan and early in the morning, they went outside, they heard that bird chirping. And they went, it seemed like that chirping came from all around. And then he went into that dwelling and that bird was all over in there. And that medicine man, they went back inside the whole con. That medicine man said, that, that bird that was tripping, that's that young man. And he's called early dawn boy. That's one of our um, holy beings that we have from the East direction. And there's also early dawn girl. And um, he said, from now on, you, you have to have compassion for people with disabilities like that. That's your responsibility. Because in our ceremonies, he said, we have prayers to identify us as early dawn boy and early dawn girl. That we have songs that we sing identifying us as early dawn boy and early dawn girl. They call blessing week ceremonies. So that's who we are, he said. And so from now on, he said, that's, we have to maintain the characteristics of early, early dawn boy and early dawn girl. So in a way, that story becomes, in our Navajo culture is, we are to be advocates for people with disabilities. And for us that have disabilities, that story says that we are also early dawn boy and early dawn girl. And we, we have a disability, so we have to advocate for ourselves too in order to help ourselves and then to help others. And so this story is uh, um, was told to me by a uh, well-known medicine man. And he said, that's who you are. And I thought about that story and uh, at that time, I was running a, a treatment center for uh, Native American youth who had um, substance abuse, drug abuse, and underlying mental disorders. And so I went to my staff and I told them this is what I was told. So I said, each and all with, each and every one of us here that work here are early dawn boy and early dawn girl. And part, part of our um, culture is that we have to maintain those characteristics because we are a program that promotes culture and uses culture, integrate Western therapy with um, uh, traditional cultural teachings. And so that became kind of our centerpiece, our theme for who we were serving. And so and then again, um, looking at, at that and using our Navajo philosophy of life and 
or now book philosophy of life basically says that we are five fingered earth surface and eternal spirits. Our purpose in life is to seek, establish, and advocate harmony so we can walk down the corn pollen path. That's what the Navajos believe the corn pollen path is the same thing as uh, the red road from, from other tribes. So they say that's what you're that's what you do first. You have to know who you are. Your five finger, your earth surface, your eternal spirits. It does not say that you're a person with a disability. It doesn't look at that. It looks at the fact that you're here on Mother Earth. You're five fingered and you're an eternal being. And looking at that and accepting that, what we call self sacredness. Self sacredness means that from a spiritual standpoint, despite who you are, despite your disability, that you have to have love for yourself. You have to understand that you're a special being, that the creator put you here on this earth and that you're part of this whole family. Also that although we're here on Mother Earth, maybe some of us are 16, 17, 14 years old, that we are millions of years old as, from a, as spiritual people the essence of who we really are. And so you get to that and understand that this is who I am. And with your thumbprints, you're the only one with that thumbprint. That's how special you are. All the millions of people in this world, you have that one thumbprint. And, and that's what they call, we call sacred wind swirls. Not only on your thumb, but you also have that on your toes, your big toe, your follow your feet. And then on top of your head, there's a wind swirl. And just these wind swirls, are, you're the only one that has that specific design or that specific print. And that makes you very, very special as an individual. And in order to establish harmony, you have to understand that about yourself. So it says we identify us and they said we seek, establish, and advocate harmony. That's our purpose. And as people with disabilities, we seek, we're looking. How can I be self-sufficient? How can I not be thirsty, hungry? How can I be not in poverty? How can I enjoy my life and go into old age in a good way? So we seek that coming to or we accept our disability, coming to understand that our life is in the palm of our hands. That's what now people say, but in what, what you want to do in life is right here in your hands. And then they say, that it's up to you. Nobody else. They can help you. They can guide you. But that commitment or that need comes from within yourself. And they have that story about the holy ones from the four directions. And one of them one day said, this gift that we have, he said, we need to give it to, to the two-legged. Uh, the five fingered ones, the earth surface people, the thing that we call happiness, harmony, serenity. And they said that, where can we put it? So they had to look for it. We can't just give it to them. They have to have a place where we can put it so they can strive to improve themselves. So one of them said, let's put it at the bottom of the ocean. The other one said technology in the future is going to take them there. It's going to be too easy for them to find. The second one said, let's put it on top of the mountain. And the same thing, technology is going to take them there. So one of these days. And then the third one said, I know where we can put it. 
You said, where, where at? They said, put it inside their heart. That's the last place they're going to look for their happiness. They're going to look all over. They're going to expect it from other people. But once they come to that conclusion that it's me, I have to be the one to make myself happy. I have to be the one to do things for myself, make decisions along the way. And like Mr. Warren was saying earlier, dream big. What are your dreams? What do you want for yourself? What do you want to achieve? And so this is going kind to of be inside your heart. And that when they find out about that, then they're going to have to look within. And they're going to the one that's going to have to begin to move in that direction. And so sometimes when I run sweat lodges, I tell the people in there, what, a year from now, where do you want to be? What do you want to be doing? What do you want to have achieved by that time? 12 moons from now, 12 months from now, what do you want? And start moving in that direction. And you're going to establish achievement. You're going to establish some degree of harmony because when you become, I want something good and you have achievement in your life, it makes you feel happy, it makes you feel confident. It gives you a positive self-image, knowing that you can do things in life. And so with that, then you establish your harmony. You establish the fact that you yourself have achieved the fact that spiritually, that you are now a believer of moral values, the do's and don'ts in life. That's what it's going to teach you as you make that journey to achieve what you want to do. It's going to help you to have good self-identity, help you to be able to respect yourself and respect those around you, and especially those that will be helpers for you. And so that's where it comes down to. You can have good emotions, you can have good feelings, you can feel good about yourself. You can have plans mentally, mental being. You can look forward to things. And then physically, you're going to take care of yourself. So balance harmony means that you're balanced spiritually, emotionally, mentally, and physically. But when we go through times and challenges because of our disability sometimes, Spiritually, we, get, we have bad attitudes and bad behaviors that we get angry about. Emotionally, we get depressed. Mentally, we don't, we're kind of stagnated. We don't really know where we're going. And then physically, we begin to have stress. So if there's ways out, that's the way you evaluate yourself. Where am I at spiritually? What behaviors do I need to change? What attitudes do I need to change? But things in life that are not good for me that I need not to engage in. And then emotionally, I want to feel good. You make that commitment to yourself that you're going to feel good. What do you need to do to feel good about yourself? Looking at your own self, your inner thoughts, how do you think about yourself? And try to reach out and help people, help people help you with that your family members or professional people. And mentally, you begin to set goals because emotionally you feel better, spiritually you feel better, then you start understanding goal setting, where you want to be, just use that. Next year, this is where I'm going to be at. When that, then that's going to happen. And then physically, you take care of yourself. You learn how to Take care of stress. You don't, you don't, sometimes our young people get into alcohol. That's what happened to me. I got into using alcohol because of my loss of vision. And it made me depressed. Sometimes I was suicidal, it seemed like. And sometimes I was angry. And I had no goals in life. How am I going to make it? 
I can't read anymore. I had two years of college behind me. But it seems like I was just doing it to myself, actually, when it came down to it. And so that's how you gauge yourself of where you're at. And so I want to also share with you a story that our elders have had taught for way back. And the story is about a little boy and a little girl, a teenage boy and his little sister. Every day they would go out in the cornfield and they would play out in the cornfield. They had big cornfield. The, the, the corn was real tall and they all lived together. You know how we were with Navajo people and Indian people. We lived like in one community, grandma, grandpa, mom and dad, aunts and uncles and, and cousins. They all live in one place, and this, this place was like that. So they went out in the cornfield, and uh, towards evening time, they would go back home, go out of the cornfield. So one day they were out there, and then they started walking back to where their house was. But when they came out of that cornfield, they came out someplace different. It wasn't where their house was, where their family was. And the little boy looked up at the sun. It was gonna go, it's gonna, it's gonna be going down pretty soon, he was saying. To his little sister. Then his sister started crying. His sister said, Don't cry, we'll find our way home. So he said, Let's go up on that hill over there and look back and see if we can find see our home. So they went up on that hill and they looked back and they still couldn't see their home. They see the cornfield below. And he said, well, let's go up a little higher. So they went up like a little higher on that, on that hill. And then that little boy began to feel scared too because the sun was going to start going down. So he looked around and he saw the tobacco plant. And then he went over there and he looked at it. And when they were walking through the cornfield, he inadvertently had picked some corn husk, corn leaf. And by, by that time it was starting to dry out because of the heat and him carrying it. And he looked around again. Then he told his sister, he said, Grandpa said, if you need help in our traditional ways, he said, if you're lost or you're frustrated, he said, you fix tobacco like this and you pray. So he took that corn husk and put that, crush up that, um, uh, tobacco plant it was dried out tobacco plant and put it in the tobacco leaf then he lit that and he smoked it and he blew it out in the four directions on mother earth and father sky and then he blessed him, his little sister with it and he blessed himself and he started praying asking the great spirits to help him to find her way home and while he was praying out of the east direction, came a bird, flew over them, it circled over them. Then it came down right above them and it dropped white water in front of them. And that bird said to them, this is white water, it's not good for you. It's coming to your people. One of these days, this white water is gonna, gonna be taking over the people. And this white water is going to take your people away from their ceremonies. It's going to take them away from their spirituality. It's going to give them bad behavior. It's going to give them mistrust. It's going to give them bad attitudes. So go back and tell your people not to use this white water. And it flew off. Then he was praying again. Then from the south direction came another bird. Came right in front of them and drew um, dropped blue water in front of them. And this blue water, the bird said, This is the only good water for your people. Tell them this is the only water they should use with because they can pray with this. It's pure. It can rejuvenate, it can reestablish good emotions. It can give them a lot of blessings. So tell them that this is the only good water that they should use. 
Then another bird came from the west direction and dropped yellow water in front of him. And that bird told him, this is not good water, it's coming to your people. It's going to destroy families. It's going to destroy relationships. It's going to cause domestic violence. Things that are not good for the community and the family and relations and interaction. And it flew off again. Tell your people this is coming. Then from the north direction, another bird came and dropped purple water. And that bird said, this is not good for you. This is not going to be good for your people. It's going to be coming. I said, it's going to give you poor health. It's going to give you cirrhosis to your people. It's going to be in a way in which people are going to become dependent on it. In a way in which it will cause them to have health problems. Go we'll tell your people that this is coming. That young man, he looked in all four directions. He told me to Matthew. Then he went over and put it out and put it under a young cedar tree. But he was told by his grandfather. And he stood up with his little sister and they looked back. He looked down the hill. Then way on the other side of that cornfield, he could see their house where he lived with his family. And they were real happy. So they came back down the hill and they went through that corn, cornfield. And they came over to their home. He took his little sister inside, then he left. And he went over to where his grandpa lives in the Hogan. So he went back into the, he went to that Hogan, then he saw his grandpa sitting on the west side of the Hogan, on the back side. And grandpa said, Grandson, I've been waiting for you. I said, over here, he said. So he sat down by his grandpa. And his grandpa said, tell me what you saw. And the little boy grand, grandson said, how do you know, grandpa? He said, because that's what I was told by the spirits. He said, tell me about it. So he told him about it. He said, there was a bird. We got lost, me and my sister. And it was a, uh, we found some tobacco. We had these birds from the four directions come white water in the east and blue water in the south, yellow water in the west, and dark purple water from the north. And he said, yes, those are messages because as Navajo people, that's our sacred color. White in the east, blue in the west and the south, yellow in the west, purple, dark purple color in the north. And he said, yes, this is going to come to us. This is called alcoholism substance abuse and it's going to come and so he said we have to tell our people about it and so today you look at those that are substance abusers and a lot of our young people and a lot of our older people are still using that for one reason or another and it's basically due to something that happened in their life as young people, but they, but they experience, some of them experience abuse, neglect, abandonment, sexual abuse, physical abuse. And that's what they call underlying mental disorder that drives that substance using. There's very few, I guess over 80%, I believe it was, that their substance use is based on mental health, underlying mental health disorder that they're still suffering from. And so sometimes we get into that because of our disability. We begin to see that. We begin to see people out. When I ran a treatment center for individuals with disabilities, our young people, we used to take them in the sweat lodge and teach them. And we teach them how to sing around the drum. And a lot of the songs have Navajo words in them, and it's where they learn how to talk Navajo. And when they leave treatment, we ask them, what's the thing that really helped you while you were here in treatment for 90 days? And they point to the sweat lodge. That's where, we, that's where I believe that I got my, my most help from. I understand that. 
Some of them have never been in this wet lodge until they came to the to the treatment treatment center. And after part of the aftercare plan was that to include not only follow up, not only going to AA, but also continuing to participate in the powwow circle and the sweat lodges and Native American church, traditional ceremonies. And so these young men, young ladies, this was back in the 90s and early, early 2000s. Now they're older, they have families. And sometimes I walk be somewhere and they would come over and tell me that they were in the treatment center and tell me what they did and what they're doing. And some of them say that, I think that what you did and what you taught us there with your staff helped me to be who I am today. And now I'm working, now I'm taking care of my family. And so in that way, our traditions, our, our culture is the basis to move ahead in life, to give you a positive self-image, give you good interaction skills, give you good health. If you think about it and you're thinking about this story, and then let me give you another story. At one time, they say, Mother Earth and Father Sky had their differences. Just like some families do, mom and dad, they have their differences. That's what happened to Mother Earth and Father Sky. It became a control issue. And Mother Earth said right here, um, on me here, a surface of who I am that belongs to me. Is under my control. And Father Sky said, okay. He said, everything from, from the atmosphere on up to the heavens is under my control. So they parted their ways. And as time passed, there was no rain. The air began to change. And the vegetation, the four-legged animals, the creepy crawlers, the plant people, they begin to vanish one by one because there was no moisture, because there was no very thin air. And there was only four spirits left. And so they went to Mother Earth and they said, Mother Earth, because of your difference with Father Sky, I'm, we're the ones that are suffering. We have lost our brothers and sisters or relatives. We don't know where they went. And there's only four of us left here. And Mother Earth had compassion. She said, "Yes, what we're what we what we're doing, your your father and me, it's not right." So he she said, "There was a bird there, so he sent this bird up." He said, "Go up there, tell Father Sky I want to make amends that our children are the ones that are suffering." So he sent this bird way up into the sky. And that bird kept flying, kept flying. And it disappeared and it gave that message to Father Sky. Four days later, way in the south direction, they saw lightning and they heard thunder. They start coming their way. First thunder boomed, the lightning flashed. Second, it got closer. Third, it got closer. The fourth time, it, the lightning flashed and that thunder boomed. Out, out of that flew this bird that was sent up there and came back down to Mother Earth. When it landed on Mother Earth, it started to rain real gentle, what we call the female rain. Then the atmosphere began to change. Then those that had disappeared began to reappear. The plant people, the creepy crawlers, the wing flappers, the four legged. They were all happy. And so these four spirits that were survivors, they were able to manage to continue to exist and who planned together to say, they went to Mother Earth and asked Mother Earth to make amends with so Father Sky was the eagle spirit, was the eagle. Another one was the tobacco plant. Yeah. The other one was a sage plant. 
and then the other the other one was a uh, cedar plant and he told these plants these beings from now on the great spirit what we call god told these four from now on you're going to be into in the ceremonies of all the indian people no matter what ceremony it is you're going you're going to be there for them because of your survivability your ability to have resilience your ability to learn how to plan through adversity your ability to challenge even though you're the child you challenged for your people you advocated for everybody so when we go to our ceremonies and we have an eagle feather and we bless ourselves with the eagle feather and that wind off of that eagle fan or even just one eagle feather we bless ourselves with it and when we bless ourselves with it that wind off of that eagle feather we inhale it and we say to ourselves and think to ourselves no matter what's happening or happening in our lives i'm going to be a survivor i'm going to be resilient i'm going to overcome what challenges have come my way and that you take in that energy from that story and then when they put on cedar sweet grass of different kinds buffalo sage you smell that you breathe it in and you put your hands there and you put it all over your body and again you think that i'm going to be a survivor just like what that story was about i'm going to challenge myself i'm going to make something of myself with this and take the energy off of that the cedar the sweet grass and then when you smell sage different kinds of sages same thing you breathe it in you take it in you reach down with your hands put it all over you and you have these good thoughts that you're going to move forward with this and when you smoke tobacco the same way special tobacco not commercial smoke ceremonial smoke and you inhale it and you bless yourself with it and you pray with it pray for good things think about good things moving forward that tobacco plant can help you so that's why we do that in our ceremonies so you young people when you go to ceremony think about that or even just at home even just at home you can do that and this blue water that we're talking about that's only good water that was said earlier in the first story if you don't have anything anywhere you're somewhere by yourself nobody around maybe and you feel frustrated or you feel don't feel right or you feel angry you can just put the glass of water down and kneel down to it and pray to it and drink that water real slow that will settle you down emotionally it will give you back that good thought process it will give you that serenity that you that you need for yourself and that's that blessing that's why that bird was saying this is the only good water and you look at that in all our ceremonies all our ceremonies no matter what tribe you're from you always have medicine water there and you pray with it and you bless yourself with it think about that you know that's a blessing that's been given to us and there was a scientific study that was done by somebody from and i think he was oriental i can't remember it's been a while but this this story not story but this is actually happened he's looking at thinking about water the science scientists and so he was thinking about how does water work how does it um, nourish us how does it nourish plants so he thought of a way to experiment with it 
And so he, he took a, a glass of water, two glasses of water. On one glass, he put happiness. On the other one, he put anger. And then he put them down, let them sit for a while. Then through a process that he had found, um, come to come to learn about or a process that he thought about, then he put this um, glass of water that had happiness on it into this process. And when he looked into that microscope, then all these different crystals came forward, all different colors. Then he looked at the other one that had anger on it. And that water was just gray, it had no life to it. And that was because this water understood, he said, anger and happiness. It has its own spirit. So again, then he took that two glasses of water. He put one into real place where there was real soft music. Another one where there was real like heavy duty metal kind of music and played that music for maybe an hour. Then he took that blast that had that real smooth, easy going music and he did put it through that process. And again, all these crystals came forward again, all the different colors. And it was real beautiful. Then he looked at the other one again that was playing that hard rock music. And it was this gray again, no life to it. So we thought he'd do one more experiment. So he took water from a hurricane and he got water from the mountain where the stream begins. And he put, he brought him back and he set them down and let him settle it down. Then he looked at the water from the mountain stream. Again, that's what happened. All those crystals came forward. A lot of life, a lot of beauty. And then the hurricane one was just gray, no life to it. And so somehow our people from our culture, we learn about medicine water, how it can help us stimulate our spirit. We pray with it. Even in Christianity, you go through baptism, it rejuvenates you. It gives you a new hope in life when you join some Christian church and you get baptized and you start making commitments. It's going to take you good places. Same thing here in our ceremonies. We drink water. We pray with it. Everybody in that ceremony, that circle, drinks off that water. And the male pray, prays with it. The female prays with it. And everybody drinks it. Well, that's very sacred. You can use that. Think about that for your culture. And so I just want to share these stories to you, give it to you so you can use it and overcome your disability and move forward and be productive in life, be happy. And if somewhere down the road, you're going to have your own transportation, your own house food on the table, place to sleep, all of this that you're looking forward to, it's gonna take you there. So just think about that. So I just want to share that with you today. Um, in our way, we say, my children, my grandchildren. I'm 73 years old, so a lot of you are probably my grandchildren. So I want to share that with you, no matter what tribe you're with, no matter where you come from, no matter what you have experienced in life, there's always hope. There's a new beginning. In the morning time, we teach our, our young people, go out, run, go out, bless yourself at that early dawn. Go out and pray with corn pollen. That's a new beginning, that new day. No matter what's happened in your life, if you believe that you want to start, this day forward, I'm going to be different. This day forward, I'm going to strive for better things. This day forward, I'm going to move in a positive direction for myself. You think that in the daytime, in the early morning, when you go out and you bless yourself at the early dawn. You can do that anytime. Start over again. 
sometimes we get off away from our goals objectives we get away from what we decided that we were going to do in our life and say despite my disability bless me this morning this is new beginning for me i have hope in you and you you do that in the morning you believe that what they call higher power you believe it and it becomes a part of you then from there on you can remember that and follow that and so i just want to share that with you um at this time and thank um the planning committee for inviting me dr kimberly robe and your your partners there and being able to share i think it's very important that spirituality is the beginning of everything when somebody wants some good something good in life so that's just what i want to share today thank you Lakota Wopi Lahaski, thank you, sir, for all of your wonderful words and prayers and reminding us to stay grounded by that spirituality that our ancestors kept strong for us, ties, resiliency, all of the above. Thank you, Mr. Hoski. It's been a wonderful two days um, having your presence around us. And thank you for all of the words you shared yesterday at our summit, keynoting. Very much appreciate you and safe travels to you and your family and your son. It was wonderful meeting him. Safe travels back to Farmington. Thank you, sir. Um, we're Thank you. Let, yes, sir. Thank you very much. We're going to let Adrian Shorty uh, commence with the program. Go ahead, Adrian. Next on the agenda will be the cultural spotlight, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, on the <laughs> schedule. We will be meeting a we will be meeting an 11 year old hoop dancer named Kwana Gretzky. Sorry for my butchering or pronunciation errors. I'm this is it's just oh, sorry, but <clears throat> Jorgensen of the of the Mississippi band the Mississippi band of white of white earth nation and learn how and learn how hoop dance has inspired his life. <clears throat> Hi, everybody. Um, I am not Kwana. However, Kwana is uh, unavailable to join at this time. But I, um, he did prepare a video that we've been able to, um, to share with everyone. Um, my name is Eva Big Horse, and I am a member of the um, Youth Disability Summit mm -hmm. Conference Planning Meeting. So happy to be here today. I am also the tribal health coordinator with the Arizona Division of Developmental Disabilities. And uh, I oversee the healthcare needs for our tribal members across the state. So I really enjoy the work that I do. Um, outside of this job, though, with the state, I also um, teach hoop dance classes here in the Phoenix Arizona area, and it's with a partnership with Ballet Arizona. And so um, our cultural spotlight today is actually one of my students. His name is Kwana Jorgensen. And um, so as I was stating before, he and his mother have graciously prepared and recorded a video, and we've been able to compile it um, into a short presentation today. Hi, my name is Kwana Jorgensen. I'm 11 years old and I'm part of the Mississippi Band White Earth Nation tribe. I've been hoop dancing for nine months. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
share with us what learning how to hoop dance has meant to you? Absolutely. I'm the first one in my family to hoop dance, which makes me proud. What I'm also proud is that me and my classmates went to Tucson to perform for some kids. It was a lot of fun, and we got to teach the kids how to pick up their hoop, our hoops and jump through them and share our culture with them. And how does it feel when you hoop dance? It makes me feel happy and free because you get to make up your own routine and make up your own story, and I got pretty good moves. And how does hoop dance connect you to your culture? How it connects me to my culture is through song and dance and being with other kids like me. Hi, I'm Greta Jorgensen, Anna Jorgensen's mother. For him learning hoop dancing, has helped him with his autism because it helps him focus. It gives him goals to work towards for performances or competitions. And it also gives him confidence. And I definitely see the confidence in his social skills. Um, with practicing for his hoop dancing, 
There are still meltdowns that happen mainly at home at times. Um, it's not all the time, but they still exist. Um, and he does elope. Um, there was one time in class where he did elope, but it was just to the bathroom. <laughs> so that was okay. He didn't go far. Um, but as far as helping him, it definitely has helped him because he is able to really focus on being able to attain his goals with being able to perform. He wants to perform for us at home. He wants to perform for his friends. He really is excited about sharing his culture with anybody who is willing. <laughs> And that really is wonderful to see. And he talks about, you know, the teaching his children and having his children wear his regalia that he wears now. So there have been instances where I have seen his communication skills, um, where he's able to um, hang out and make new friends or multiple friends at competitions and also communicate appropriately with other adult dancers that he has never met before. And so it is a big change in him from when he first started dancing class to loud enough for me to hear quite a ways away <laughs> on, you know, talking with somebody that he's really excited to share something about. So it's been really great for us. And I wish that we would have been able to find hoop dancing sooner for us in our journey for autism. Thank you. Okay. So that is Quana Jorgensen and we do have him and his mother present today. Um, I do just want to emphasize that Quana learned dancing about nine months ago, so he hasn't been dancing very long, but as his teacher, I just want to commend him, and I teach a, a variety of children, um, some with, some with disabilities, some with no disabilities, and he has stood out as one of the fastest learner, probably in both of his cohorts. He started in beginners, and now he's an intermediate. And he just comes to class prepared every week. And I, I know that he practices at home because I can tell when he comes to class every week. And so um, I was just happy that he was willing to share his, his story um, and just wanted him to have the opportunity and his mom as well to, um, to be present. Um, that being said, uh, I've, I also wanted to share, I'm sorry, I forgot to do this at the beginning, but the the story behind the hoop dance, and I always encourage my, my students to know its origin. So the hoop dance actually started in the Pueblo area. And um, some people say Taos Pueblo, Jemez Pueblo, but it was one of those two Pueblos in New Mexico. And it started as a, as a healing dance for them. And um, I think they still do it ceremonially today, but the, the hoop dance itself has evolved into an intertribal um, kind of social kind of dance. It's done socially, it's also done competitively. And Kwana actually competed this year for the first time in the Herd Museum's World Championship Hoop Dance Competition. And so that is, that is an amazing accomplishment in itself because it's one thing to dance, hoop dance, but it's another thing to be in a space where you're with other hoop dancers that have been working just as hard as you have and you jump into an arena and you're being judged and there's audience around you. And so Quana was excited to do that. He jumped in there and he did a great job. I think that's the best I've ever seen him dance. Um, but 
like he said in his video too, the dancer with time is as they become more comfortable with their style should be able to see things in their own life and be able to create those formations as a dancer and integrate that into their routine. And so um, again, Kwana has picked up on the routine that I have created for the students, but he's gone above and beyond and he's even started integrating his own moves into his routine. And maybe, maybe you guys as audience members seeing him for the first time didn't notice that. But other, other hoop dancers like, and me, because I'm familiar with his style, I can tell which moves are new that he put in on his own. And so just his level of creativity has really been outstanding in, um, in his group of, of students. And so in that way, um, I, I always tell the students that this, you're telling a story, you're telling a creation story, you're representing phenomena from the earth and the sky. And so you might've saw an eagle, a butterfly, a horse. Um, you might've seen some more contemporary moves because we live in a contemporary modern age. So um, anyways, I just wanted to share a little bit of the origin and the story of the hoop dance and um, open it up for any questions that anyone might have. We do have Kwana and his mom available also to answer any questions. Hey Kwana, this is Kimberly. I don't know if you see the chat, but we got some great comments and thank you Eva for sharing this awesome treasure with us. Thank you, Mrs. Jorgensen. This was an awesome moment. Thank you for the spotlight. Dr. Daryl Joseph says you got some moves, Kwana. Thank you for sharing your superpowers and giving us strength. And Betty Schoen says, I love that you're willing to travel to share your culture with other young people and teach them some of the job that you experienced with dancing. Great job. And I did want to mention that last year we highlighted Eva. So thank you for <laughs> continuing to share, Eva. It's awesome. And Betty Schoen has her hand raised. Juana, I loved your dance. Thank you so much for doing that for us. It was it was awesome. And I'm glad that Eva shared that uh, I did actually see an eagle. I did actually see a butterfly. And I did see a horse. So <laughs> your message is perfectly clear. And um, as a ballroom dancer, not to be compared with hoop dancing, but <laughs> no way. But your, your physicality is amazing and um just keep it up because you are you are going to be a real competitor uh, as you are now thank you steve freeman says only nine months that is incredible and indeed it is you must have some really good teachers behind you kwana great job kwana says jim warren and Adrian Shorty says, keep up the great work, Kwana. Thank you, young sir. You're awesome. Thanks. I got a good, I got a really good teacher. And we have Anna Bellagi. I just tortured your name, sorry. Um, keep sharing this legacy of the creator who gifted you with such a beautiful gift and talent. So wonderful, heartfelt gratitude from power of loved ones. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Good. I'd like to say just this past weekend, we traveled down to the Tucson Wake Pow, Wake uh, Pow Wow, and they had a special dance there for the hoop dancing. And so I thought that would be a good opportunity for Kwana to see um, all of the Pow Wow dances and go in for the special dance. And when it came time for the special hoop dance competition, out came three former and current world championships <laughs> dancers with him. And so it was really awesome to see him out there with his people that he look up to, the other adults and seniors in the categories and they just welcomed him into the circle into the arena there with open arms and it's such a such a great community where they're so friendly and pardon 
and Quana being out there with adults that where he was anticipating to have other kids his own age out there, he was able to stay out there and do his performance and he kept his composure. And I think if I would have been in his position, I would have wanted to <laughs> go sit that one out. <laughs> but he was very brave and he completed the competition. Good job, Quana. Thank you. And mom. <laughs> Thank you. He's got um, Quana, really... Oops, sorry. <laughs> no, I was just going to say, is there anything, Quana, is there anything you would like to share from your experience, from your video or anything? Well, one thing's for sure. Gunshots in the background when I was doing it were annoying. No. During the video? Um, yeah, during the video. I don't know. Yeah. So as, <laughs> I as I could hear. <laughs> yeah, as a hoop dancer, and you'll learn this, Quana, you, you'll dance in some really nice indoor places, but outdoor, that's kind of my favorite place to dance because you're dancing, usually touching the earth, and you have to adjust to different elements that are happening, whether it's wind, sometimes rain, um, sand, <laughs> you get kind of all of it. But um, but yeah, I didn't even I didn't even know that he went down and participated in that special. But I think that really speaks to to kind of bring it full circle here. I think Quana's example here is like perfectly integrated with what Dr. Joseph was talking about earlier about acknowledging your superpowers and having community behind you. I think Quan is a great example of um, kind of cultivating this, this talent that he has. And with that talent, he's been able to meet other hoop dancers. And uh, we are a family, you know, we, we know each other with time, we get to meet each other at different places and times. And we are that extended kind of family for each other. So I think it's a beautiful thing and appreciate Hosky's stories as well. Um, I learned hoop dance from my father who's Navajo. And so he taught me in the Navajo style. And then I, I kind of share my style with, with students. But like I said, I encourage them to develop their own style from whatever tribe or community that they're from. So it's a, it's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful tool where they can empower themselves and tell their own stories. So Anyways, I don't see any further questions or comments, but I'm so happy that we could share this story with you today and thank Quana and uh, Greta for joining us today. Um, I'll turn it back over to the to the MCs. Thank you. Um, Adrian, before we move on with our program, um, I, I would be amiss if I didn't mention our planning committee and we have our folks here. So I wanna give everyone um, on the planning committee uh, Mateo, Anya, Eva Big Horse introduced herself. We have Miss Annette Yazi, Miss Betty Johns, Miss Cassandra Pina, Mr. Sean Sellers, Miss Christy Kelly, and Miss Elizabeth Jeffrey Franco. So if you want to just step out and just say what you do real quickly, and we can move on with our program. But I want to give you guys recognition. It's been a great program. Sean? Cassandra, do you want to introduce yourself? Anya, go ahead. Hi, everyone. My name is Anya Carrillo. I am um, on the planning committee. Um, I am a young adult who has a disability. I'm also from the Pueblo of Laguna, but I also am Hopi, Lakota, and Seneca. Um, really excited to be here. Um, yeah, I work for Diversability Incorporated as their peer-based person or peer-based um, support specialist. And I also help with Sonoran You Said and um, their Find Their Ways um, program. And, and, and I am their um, youth engagement coordinator. Thank you, Anya. Uh, Annette? Did I see Annette Yazi? 
Um, how about Betty John? Hello. I don't know if you can see me. Um, hi, my name is Betty John, and I am um, very excited to see a lot of people here and just have, hearing the stories and uh, the dancing and welcome. Thank you very much. I'm with Mercy Care and I'm a, uh, on the planning committee. Thank you. Christy Kelly. Hi, everybody. My name is Christy Kelly. I am the director of the Sonoran, you said, Native Center for Disabilities, and I am on the planning committee. I'm uh, enrolled with the Navajo Nation, uh, also on my mother's side, affiliated with Tulalip and Yakima tribes, and I'm really excited to see all the participants. Thank you for coming. Mateo? Hello, uh, my excuse me. My name's Mateo Treetop. I am Hunk Papa Lakota, uh, and I work with uh, uh, the Sonoran News said as a graphic designer, uh, part-time graphic designer for them. Um, and I'm just, I'm a youth voice for the planning committee. Uh, to get uh, some of that uh, youth perspective and make sure that yeah, uh, we can engage as many youth as possible. Thank you. Thank you. You back, Sean Sellers? Maybe not. He was on the phone. And Cassandra Pina. I am here. Go ahead, introduce yourself, Cassandra. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Cassandra Pena. I'm Akima Atham, a member of the Gila River Indian community, as well as Hopi. I am a tribal liaison with Molina Healthcare, and we're one of the sponsors. Um, today's been um, a powerful um, presentation, and I'm just happy to be here. And thank you all for, for joining today. Thank you. And Annette Yazi. No, Annette. Okay, um, last call for Sean. Okay, he's on the dog. He's on the phone with the vet. His dog's sick. Um, okay, Adrian, we're going to go ahead and resume with the program, sir. Um, take it over. All righty. So up next, we're going to be doing the Finds Their Way project, which will be presented by Anya Carrillo and Mateo Treetop in collaboration with Tribal State and community partners, the Sonoran Center for Excellence in Disabilities has created Finds Their Way. The project addresses unique needs and challenges experienced by Native American youth with disabilities by utilizing a multifaceted and indigenous approach. The goal is to increase access for Native, for Native American students, for Native students with disabilities to skill development knowledge, services, and supports to participate in long-term competitive integrated employment careers, fi careers finds their way, empowers youth by focusing on youth and activities and gaining youth-focused perspectives. Anya and Mateo, you may take it away. Thank you so much, AJ or Adrian. Um, so today, like Adrian has mentioned, we're gonna talk about finds their way, but we're also gonna integrate why the youth voice is so important and why me and Mateo believe it is so important. And the reason why we're a part of so many things that have to do with peer led and um, youth led um, initiatives or, um, thing. So I'm going to just give a little um, background about myself and hopefully Mateo will do the same. So again, I'm Anya Carrillo. I am 26 years old. I am a mother of three beautiful children um, who age from five to one. So five, four, and one. And I am from the Pueblo of Laguna, but I'm also Hopi, Lakota, and Seneca, like I mentioned. I work for Diversability Incorporated, as well as the Sonoran, you said. 
And um, one of the things that I love to do is share about why the youth voice is so important, um, especially because if you were here last year, I talked about how um, a voice can be taken away so easily and um, muting a, a youth's voice is so easily done um, that I want to be a part of committee, um, communities and committees that allow voice um, youth voices to be heard. Mateo. Hello. <laughs> um, so a little bit more about myself is that uh, I am also 26 years old. Uh, I've been involved with uh, the disability community in Arizona for a very long time. Um, I am a recent uh, graduate of, well, of Scottsdale Community College with a, a degree of graphic design and uh, uh, theater arts. And that's just <laughs> uh, the reason why I am about, uh, <laughs> uh, I wanna, I don't know, let me retrain my thoughts. Okay, so the reason why it's important for me uh, to be involved in the disability community is because um, through uh, theater, I was able to find my own voice and you know discover more about who I am and uh, who I'm not uh, through the various well, uh, <laughs> various different roles I got to play in many different productions and. I want to help uh, other people find uh, their voices and who they are as well. And um, <laughs> because when it comes to our uh, traditional communities, we might be able to find parts of ourselves, but uh, there's still a lot more that um, uh, we can explore <laughs> with the help of uh, many different communities and perspectives. Awesome, thank you, Mateo. So like I said, we're gonna talk about finds their ways, communities for youth transition. So some of the overview, or overview and purpose is challenges experienced by native youth with disabilities, engage a network of tribal, state and community partners, increase access to culturally responsive services and supports, improve employment opportunities and outcomes, promote Native youth leaders and advocates, and develop a Native and youth-led transition framework. So something, like we said, is this is youth-led. Um, Sonoran, you said, gratefully um, had me and Mateo both join their team, as well as some other youth that we're going to be roping in <laughs> at the end of this year. And we are so grateful that we're able to um, go ahead and talk to our peers about some of the things that they need in their areas. Um, what we found is a lack of acknowledging youth um, in the systems and um, really systems saying, this is what you need here, attend it and it not really working. And so giving the youth a voice to say, this is what we need and this is what we want. Um, that's when youth really decided to show up and be a part of things and um, kick butt at what they're doing. So um, that's why they started saying, okay, well, let's start getting native youth to lead this initiative. And then also um, have their voices be a huge role and important part in um, the Find Your Way program. Mateo. So our approach here is just, um, you know, <laughs> to uh, basically um, create some opportunities for, uh, you know, youth to have, um, <laughs> to have their voices heard. Um, some of the ways that we do that is uh, through talking circles and um, so that everybody's voice is uh, acknowledged and they have the time and the space 
to give the input and feedback. Um, and uh, <laughs> we also want to, uh, uh, you know, get more of the elders um, input as well, uh, the, because that is uh, incredibly important. Um, because they've, you know, lived, uh, you know, a life uh, that um, a lot of us might not uh, have experience and uh, uh, ways that they would probably feel that it would be best moving forward for um, uh, to help the, uh, <laughs> the youth uh, in a more traditional sense. And uh, we want to just create a you know a cross cultural uh, uh, community uh, collaboration because uh, disability itself you know it it's cross cultural um, and many people, many different communities have their own ways of uh, handling disability and talking about it or uh, you know. Um, so we just want to like <laughs> we just want to get a lot more perspectives. So some of the things that come to mind when talking about our approach is um, having the elders and the tribal leaders guide us through this process. One thing that I got from a yacht a, a lot not a yacht, <laughs> a lot of youth and young adults was that they felt like if they were to advocate for themselves or speak up is that they would disrespect the elders. How do we respect elders while still advocating for ourselves was a huge question. And so um, I had to kind of um, tell them, you know what, asking for help is guidance. It's it's asking for their input and their successes and their downfalls, knowing what it is that they would have done better and how they would have um, worked around certain things or how they would have want to spoke up to elders um, in a way that um, that even nowadays youth don't want to do because they feel it would be disrespectful. But when you combine that advocacy with guidance, you have this leadership approach where the native youth are having the voice of leadership. So they're obtaining that guidance from the um, elders who are leaders in their communities, but, <coughs> excuse me, but are, um, getting their guidance from those elders so it's not really disrespectful at all it's it's more of that i need your help and um these are the things i want to do and these are the things i need but i also want to hear your voice on what it is that you would have wanted or what it is that you would have needed when you were my age um, the talking circle is so important as well, getting the youth to really listen and hear um, their other peers list things that they need and be like, oh yeah, I that would be really helpful, or then come up with new ideas that would help them out in these um, endeavors. So we're, we're looking at employment um, in the, um, uh, I'm blanking, and find your way. Um, we're doing employment opportunities and how we can um, lead Native youth to figure out what it is that they need in order to obtain employment and transition services. Um, I'm going to keep going, but I have a lot more to add just because it's such a big topic and um, um, so we might stop along the way as well. All right, let's see. So native framing of disability. Native disability must include culture and reflect ways of being for tribal people. This includes a collectivist ontology, not me, collaboration, I see you, hear you, and other members of our family community tribe, compassion, we are all in this together, and courage, we are strong together. So 
when you think of it in this way, framing disability in a way that it's collaboration, compassion, and courage, um, this is all of us, just not us. Um, something that was mentioned before um, was that disability was not a word um, for our people. I remember a story that my grandma or my so'o told me, and um, it's about her brother or her dad's brother. And he had a disability. And this was back in the day. I mean, my, my grandma, um, she's, she told me that this was back when they had homes for people who had disabilities and how the government was locking these people who have disabilities up in homes. And she didn't know why she was just a little girl. And so she told me how before then they would just make adjustments. So accommodations for people who have disabilities without using the word accommodations. Um, for him, he had strengths in one area that was used really well in helping with the family. Um, and so his brothers and sisters had strengths in other areas that help with family. They never thought of his um, difference or adjustment as a disability. They just thought of him as a family member. So when the government came and took their uncle, um, he was locked away up in a um, home for people with disabilities and they didn't get to visit him often or see him often because I mean, they worked a lot and had to provide for their family and she never understood why. So when I started um, telling her about my disability, she was very surprised that I still lived in the community. Um, and then she also was surprised to find out that my papa has a disability, that she has a disability, that my dad has a disability. And uh, like, she didn't realize that, oh, wow, we're living in the same community. And like, we could be part of um, the community that we live in. And so that's one story that I'd like to tell because um, my soul started saying, well, you need to go to my tribe. You need to go back to Hopi. You need to go back to Hopi. You need to tell them. You need to tell them, Anya, what it is that you, like, you need to tell them everything. And so um, I didn't really know what she wanted me to tell them. She just kept telling me I needed to tell them about disability. So in 2017, I won the Advocates and Disabilities disability award and I um, used my award money to go to the Hopi tribe and teach them about um, or not teach them but really just talk to them about disability and what I believe is important in advocacy and self-determination and who I am as a person and see if there was anything that I could help them with um, it was very hard because I hadn't been back to Hopi um, in a long time. And my soul was very, very sick at this time. And so I couldn't bring her out with me. Um, but it was really cool to see how the compassion came together, the courage, the collaboration in a world where disability wasn't a word, but in a world where disability was loved and taken care of just like any other community or community person or person, a part of the community, um, it wasn't separated. It was just, it was just another person in the community who was loved. Um, anything to add to this one, Mateo? <laughs> uh, sure. So, <laughs> you know, um, just with my own, uh, you know, journey and uh, the things that I've learned from a lot of my friends and family that are of, you know, uh, Native American descent, is that, you know, this looks a lot, you know, <laughs> you know, a lot similar throughout many different Native American cultures, is that, you know, disability was not you know was you know wasn't a uh, a word and that you know as we see that you know we kind of had to get back to uh our own understanding of disability um uh, and our own you know, definitions of disability than what the you know, medical models or the, uh, the American models of disability tells us disability is, which is 
you know, to them, not good, but to a lot of Native people, it, <laughs> it wasn't, you know, it wasn't truly an issue. So. Yes, definitely. So decolonize the disability model. Um, so like Mateo said, it was very different um, for, I mean, um, the tribes that I've heard stories from, I'm not speaking for all tribes because, you know, there's so many of them, um, but from the tribes I'm from and from um, family, friends, disability wasn't a word. So um, what we do is decolonize the disability model. So um, Native Indigenous individuals in the center of it all. And then there's immediate family and extended family. Then there's the tribal community, tribal chapter, district, or band, the tribal nation, and the intertribal Native and Indigenous people. So this is a whole community of people who are supporting that one ind individual um, in their journey. Um, it doesn't matter if they have a disability or not. I believe that this is for all youth um, and all people um, in the, we really just lay, we, we're a big community that um, is supportive of one another. I grew up dancing in powwows. I was a jingle dress dancer. And then once my knees got bad, <laughs> I became a Southern um, traditional dancer. And um, that was another big part of the, the community that I had was my family from the powwows. Is, it wasn't just my um, tribe. And um, I wasn't just the Pueblo of Laguna. When I'd go to the feast, I'd still have my whole family there in my community to support me. But it was also those people who were part of my power community and, um, and my friends and their families and um, the big um, drum group that my dad was a part of them they were a big family and most of the drummers that he jam drummed with they're my brothers those are my uncles those are my cousins and so being able to have those people to rely on and have as um, family and as a community is something that um, is really really awesome to have e even I, I I mean I never they never brought up my disability. They never said, oh, she has a disability. Be careful with her. <laughs> oh, she has a disability. Don't let her dance or don't let her be a background singer. No, just, uh, no, they they held me, they supported me and they helped me all along the way. All right. So now we're gonna go ahead and talk about the talking circles, Mateo. So, with the talking circles, uh, you know, it's not necessarily a practice in um, uh, a lot of uh, tribal communities in uh, the Southwest, or uh, I'm not sure if it's <laughs> a practice anywhere other than uh, the Northern Plains, but um, you know, these uh, type of uh, talking circles, uh, you know, it's, <laughs> you know, it's a good way to, you know, allow us to, uh, you know, gain some new, yeah, yeah, some uh, youth voices. And, you know, it, you know, uh, among various Native communities, they always have, you know, some type of teaching of, you know, the circle is a very powerful shape. It, you know, it holds a very um, a powerful energy, and that by uh, holding uh, these uh, <laughs> talks, you know, within a circle, that you know everybody can see everybody, and that nobody has um, nobody has uh, more power over anybody else, and so. With that, you know, it helps you, um, the youth, to, you know, just feel more included. Like they do, you know, they can have their voices heard and, um, you know, share their stories in a in a non judgmental space. Uh, <laughs> because. Uh, 
Ooh, sorry, um, that's that's what I have to say. Hi. Hi. So one thing I mentioned before is the youth and young adults' voice is very important in this process. And so giving that voice for Native youth to share what it is that they need to share and what to share is really impactful, I believe, for anybody. Uh, but for youth who uh, may be a little bit more shy and a little bit more not understanding what it is that they need, but listening to those other youth who are more vocal and have um, the ability to um, speak more. Um, we have a lot of those youth who shout out answers and, and they give that strength to other youth. And that's where that um, shared power comes from. So when you hear one youth who's really shy and they don't really want to say anything, but then they hear their whole circle of friends talking or the youth that are in their community start talking about what it is that they need and they want or the, the things that empower them, those shy youth start coming out of their shells and they start saying, hey, I could do this too. Here's me, gonna, I'm gonna speak up. I'm going to tell you what I need or what I want, what I don't like, what I like. And it gives them that power of using their voice in a way that they didn't believe they could in the beginning. And that's what I think is so impactful from these talking circles is allowing um, these youth who are more shy to have of that voice and the um, their opinions to be heard and let them know that they can be heard because it is not a judgmental space it's not somewhere where we come and say no sorry you said you wanted that but there's nowhere we're going to do that how can we work on these things how can we build um, ways for you to be able to do the things that you want and you need um, I believe it's very important um, I also think that um, what was shared in dancing and the hoop dancer that shared last session was very important, giving the youth the ability to talk about what it is they want in their community um, and what they want to do. Um, I remember telling my mom at a young age when we went to our first powwow and my dad, I said, I want to, I want to dance. I want to be a jingle dress dancer. I want my dress to make tons of noise and I want to make, I want to heal because they told me that's what the dance was about it's from the Ojibwe people and that it's a healing dance and it's a prayer dance and so I wanted to do that I I always had the power of prayer my mom and dad said and um I wanted to do that I wanted to heal those who were sick I wanted to um make a difference in people's lives and um so they I believe that's one really important way of showing that as well as through dance and through um, um, what you do um, and your hoop dance is really important. So if you're still here, I commend you on doing that. That's part of your voice. And I just wanted to say that because I wanted to say that earlier, but I didn't have a chance to. So. So now we completed a landscape analysis from the indigenous perspective. This is where we got some of our youth peers and our young adults peers, and we started um, getting some um, information on what it is that could help. We also talked about the importance of personal connections and building bridges, uh, designing the format to reflect native culture, making it meaningful for tribal members and nations, and what we are hearing. So. Um, we have a lot of that stuff. Um, and then the next PowerPoint is about engaging youth. Um, so when we engage youth, what is it that we want to do? How did we get engaged in this, Mateo? They asked us about our story. I was able to present last year talking about my voice and what I, I believed is so right for other youth. And that's how I got engaged. Um, they heard my story and they're like, okay, Anya, can you please help us with this? And like, teach us about your story and teach us how we can involve other youth. And do you have any other youth? And I'm like, Mateo, like, <laughs> um, AJ, I like named off a bunch of youth and I'm only bringing you two up because you're right here. But, um, yeah, so we share our personal story and our journey in order to have them better understand what our needs and our wants are. Um, we look for youth leadership. This is something huge to us. I mean, from our backgrounds, 
where we come from a youth leadership form. That's how we met. Um, and we believe that youth leadership is so important. Having our um, seats at the table, being able to speak what it is that we find is very important. I sit on six committees right now and one board. Um, I did a list of them yesterday because I was like, okay, I told somebody six, but then I was like, wait, I'm on a board and six committees now. So um, being able to tell people, this is what we need. This is what we want. This is what I'm collecting from my peers and the work that I do. Um, this is this is how we engage you. They see us in these leadership roles. They say, see Mateo. They see how amazing he is at what he does. And they, um, they're like, I want to be like Mateo. I want to lead like Mateo. I want to speak like Mateo. I want to um, give my use my voice for better like Mateo has. And it's really awesome to be able to do that through this program. So um, we also teach the value of culture and traditions. Uh, like I said, um, culture is very important to me. Um, my family traditions, my papa was a, um, um, a kachina, doll maker and <laughs> and those are important to us so learning about that and keeping that in our family and him teaching my dad how to do it so that my dad can teach my son how to uh, make kachinas and my soul was able to teach me a little bit about the painting of her kachinas because she painted all the kachinas and then I was able to now teach my kids how to paint or my daughters how to paint the kachinas and uh, just learning these small important traditions they're not small but they're huge um, traditions that will be carried throughout the generations of my family hopefully um, teaching those to other youth um, Mateo were you there you were in Gila River we did a YLF um, that's also tied into the find your way and uh, one of the coolest things to hear from these youth were that they wanted more cultural and um, traditional like um, they wanted to know more about it they wanted to be ingrained in their traditions and their culture they wanted to be a part of their dances more they wanted to be a part of uh, they wanted to ask their grandparents questions about where they came from who they are and it was really cool um I thought it was really awesome that these youth trusted us enough to like help guide them to ask them these questions and like really put together these questions for their elders and their community do you have anything else to add Mateo yeah, so, um, you know, a big part of, you know, Find the Way is, you know, just outreach and making sure that um, we can uh, serve the different uh, uh, tribal nations and communities throughout uh, the state of Arizona, and that, you know, we... Uh, this past October, we did hold a, uh, an AZYLF, an Arizona Youth Leadership Forum, uh, for uh, young adults and youth who have disabilities, uh, guiding them into transitioning into adulthood. Um, we held that on the Gila River Indian uh, community. Um, and uh, a part of that, uh, you know, is a part of, you know, why this, uh, why Find Soway is here. And uh, the next one that we will be holding is uh, one in the the Tohono O'odham uh, Nation. Uh, the dates are not, <laughs> haven't been finalized yet, but, you know, uh, just reaching out to the different tribal communities. Uh, and spreading the word of just helping to, to, uh, the youth understand their disability and giving them the tools and knowledge to uh, be successful as they go through life and uh, transition, uh, uh, you know, is definitely a big part of, you know, that fuels me and the, uh, my engagement and I believe Anya as well. Um, and you, uh, 
<laughs> just uh, uh, just the impact of me and Anya and many other of our Native uh, peers helping other Native youth. You know, that's <laughs> that's how we are. Uh, we hopefully will spread, uh, you know, our message to different tribal communities. So, definitely. Um, so, one thing that we're working on now too is um, these program, this um, Find Your Way program is not only going to be directed towards youth have disabilities because disability is a non-existent word in the Native culture. Um, there's a lot of people who don't believe that they have a disability or they don't see um, that they have a disability and that's okay, but um, we're opening our doors to um, tribal communities to engage all youth to figure out what it is that they need in transition um, um, and help in transition. Um, Something I want to bring up is the mentorship of other Native youth. So we have several Native youth who have participated in the YLF programs or the Arizona Youth Leadership Forum. And um, they are incredible, amazing students, as is everybody that we get at AZYLF. But they are people who are now um, in jobs, have gone to college or going to college. They are going to be able to mentor other youth on how to continue to do this and how to stay engaged with your community and be a part of the community. Um, and then peer support. So that's a huge thing as well. Having another youth paired up with an, um, somebody that is interested and really guiding them through the processes of transition um, to adulthood or transition into any type of situation um, is really awesome. Um, so achieving employment is the big goal of all of this. Um, so again, personal story and journey. Um, what are young adults with disabilities telling us? Um, what are some work experiences in high school, employment programs after high school, community help and supports, listen and give youth a chance to look forward? One thing that we talked about and something that was really important to me is that um, when we talk about transition, the first thought is, well, then we're going to have to go to the city. Uh, we're not going to be able to stay in our community. There's not enough jobs. There's not enough resources to stay in our community. And so something I brought up with um, one of the fellow people that we work with and find your way was how do we engage the community and find local um, employments and local jobs and um, community jobs that we can um, explore. How about the, I mean, when I go to Hopi, I see a bunch of um, stands out there and young guys selling their artwork or young women selling their artwork, or um, I've met a few book writers and storytellers and um, even the Native government um, why can't, why can't we get them involved with them? Like, why do we have to say, okay, well, <laughs> you got to go to college. And I, that's not a lot of youth, um, you know, transition process. That's not a lot of what they always need or want. And so how can we support youth who want to stay in their community? And how do we help find these ways to help them um, and in, like engage with them so that they understand that they are able to do what it is that they want to um, in their community. One thing that I found um, also is that um, when speaking to a lot of youth, um, when they talk about transition and they start talking about where to live next, like when you're 18 in um, the city, most of the time it's like, okay, well, you're 18, move out now. Um, my mom is uh, not native, she's non-native. And she said, when we're 18, we're moving out. But when I saw, like, when I went with my dad, he said, you're 18, so this is how you're gonna help support our family and this is how we're gonna support you. You have a free place to live. Um, and this is, you just wanna get a job so that you're able to help support um, 
Um, is there anything you need? Do you want to um, go to college? How, how can we get you to college? Like very supportive. And I found that with a lot of, of my like native friends, it's the same way. They're not kicked out at 18 and not told to move on from their family. Instead, they're engaged with their family. They're um, growing with their family. They're helping out. I was a caregiver to my papa and my dad and um with my dad having heart problems and my papa having dementia, I moved in with them to help and take care of them. And they helped me with my kids and help raise them. And it was a big community inside one little home. And so um, that's something else that we're talking about. How do we support? How do we help? How do we engage youth who want the same thing that I had when I was 18 until just recently? Um, if you ask, my dad, he said, I didn't want you to leave until you were married <laughs> because um, once you're married, then your husband or whoever it is can take care of you. And that's the home that you will be in next. But until then, um, I want you to stay here so that we can help support one another. And then once you get your family of your own, that's when you move on. And so that was a big thing that I had to relearn. And then I talked to my native friends and I said, is this the same way for you? And they're like, yeah, yeah. My mom doesn't want me to leave until um, I, I find my own family. And I'm like, oh, okay. Like I'm not, this isn't so different. You know, this is who we are as people. This is my, this is my culture. This is who we are. And it's so cool to see how supportive our whole family is of one another. So Achieving employment may be a goal, but when you're talking to Native youth, not always um, is the moving out part <laughs> a goal yet. Um, so how do we achieve employment in the way that will help support them? And, and what, what type of employment is that? That doesn't, it doesn't have to be moving miles and miles away from your home or um, going into the city to find a job because that sometimes that's not possible. All right, Mateo. All right, so some some tips and uh, tips and lessons learned. So engaging diverse uh, uh, voices from uh, the community where you wish to serve and or provide services. Be open to learning about culture, uh, importance of respect and uh, humility. Uh, youth are the experts on their needs, strengths, and abilities. Uh, we can provide opportunities for youth uh, to grow in these areas. And then youth are leaders now and in the future. Now, you know, uh, when it comes to, you know, uh, anyone basically you know you are your own best expert you you know what's going on inside of you and you know sometimes you know with parents or you know your parent um they you know they've been around you and they can see you know how you operate and how you feel but you know, you are your own, <laughs> as you, uh, there are the best um, uh, experts in that field. Um, and yes, yeah, so there are some things that they might need to work on um, in different ways in which we can help them uh, grow. But overall, you know, it's it's been our experience uh, just uh, through helping uh, different uh, youth that you know they have you know they know what they want to do they, they might have an idea of where they want to go it's just you know us helping them along those ways and seeing what we can do to help them uh, achieve you know whatever goal they have in mind, you know, whether it is uh, getting a job or uh, on what path, you know, that might take, whether it's, you know, college and apprenticeship, um, 
custom employment. Um, because honestly, if we set them up for success, you know, the hope here is we have, you know, uh, we have people that can further set other people up for success that is based upon, you know, uh, their own needs and their own wants and uh, listening to, you know, those that they help. And hopefully that goes further along down the road. So, when you were 14 years old, do you want to tell your mom about every little thing, like your crush or your your day at school? Do you remember going home and saying, oh, "I don't want to talk about it"? Uh, <laughs> I do, <laughs> I do. And on my mom every day, she's like, "What do you have for lunch?" And it's like <laughs> the same thing. Like, yeah. yeah, it's the same thing. It's like. <laughs> I had a peanut butter and jelly sandwich for lunch. That was my lunch, you know, yeah. with milk, you know. Yeah. And so <laughs> when you think about that, how many of you guys have um, children of your own or they're in that age where they're like, eh, nothing, or it was fine, or it was okay. But when you have a, a group led by youth and young adults who have been in their shoes just not long ago um, and like get to engage with them in a way that is, <laughs> I mean, we get to tell them, you know what, you get to tell us whatever you want. And if you want to tell us, that's okay. If you don't want to tell us, okay. Like it's not helping us, it's helping you. And so um, being able to do that and have the, um, them know that they're leaders and that they're going to lead their decisions and that they're the center of everything that is important to them um, is really important in some of the things that we do with Find Your Way or with all the things that we do in Find Your Way and all of the things that we do with our youth leadership forms. Um, one thing, like I've said before, and I'll say it again, their voice is so important and we make that clear to them. And so, yeah, they might not you may have told them that as well as a mom and dad, but it's so much different coming from a mom and dad than when it's coming from youth and young adults in their community who have gone through the same things that they have gone through in like, what, three years, four years ago, rather than like, like my son says a million years ago, because apparently that's how old I am. Um, <laughs> so being able to be there for the youth um, and young adults to understand what they are going through and how we can provide them with opportunities so that they can grow in those areas is really important. Because we don't want to just hear, oh yeah, mama, yeah, it's fine. Oh yeah, dad, it's fine. Like. <laughs> So um, we did a few, a bunch of this already, and I feel like our time is coming up pretty short. So I'm going to go through that already. And then this is um, our team. There's a few more others on our team, but there wasn't enough space on this page um, to pull all of us. So if you're a part of our team, thank you so much. Um, but this is the executive director, Wendy Parent Johnson. I'm Anya Curio. I'm the youth engagement coordinator coordinator. Mateo is, Mateo, I forgot your title, so I didn't write it in there. What's your title again? Uh, I'm, <laughs> I'm, to be frank, this, uh, the peer, advisor, right? yeah. Yeah, I thought so, but I was like, uh. and then Joshua Drywater is our program manager. Um, if you have any more questions, please feel free to reach out to any of us today. Um, and um, yes, thank you guys so much. Thank you, Anya and Mateo. Outstanding, outstanding work you're doing. Your advocacy, your leadership is, is much needed out there. And thank you for making the difference out there for our tribal youth and tribal communities. Thank you. And um, FYI, everyone, um, I moved to the city uh, back in 2000 from uh, Lachi uh, on the Navajo reservation lived out there. And when I first came to the city, I powwow. And um, I actually danced with Mateo and Anya when these kids were like five and six years old. So I'm gonna be 56. And I know it seems like I've known these guys about half my life and you're doing outstanding things out there in Indian country. So thank you both. Thank Do we have you. questions? Any questions, Anya, or anyone? 
Thank you. Um, we'll go ahead and move on to the program. But before we move on to the program, I also want to thank our ASL interpreters, Jen and Miss Kelly, for joining us today and um, giving your, your assistance for our audience. Thank you very much, ladies. We appreciate it. Um, go ahead, Adrian. Okay, so I believe. Oh, wait, whoops, I forgot my camera's not on. Um, so I believe next on our agenda is a youth panel featuring Michael Tom, Antonio Menigotes, Adriana Black, Ubaldo Garcia, and Colton Benali. Travel youth will share their personal stories of how, of how they have navigated education and work in relation to disability related con con concerns or barriers. They will serve as role models for some ways travel youth can engage with services and resources to develop self-advocacy, knowledge, and skills. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm not any one of those students uh, on the panel, uh, but I do want to introduce uh, myself because uh, these students uh, work with me uh, on a program called Supporting Inclusive Practices in Colleges, which is a post-secondary transition program for students who identify as uh, individuals with uh, intellectual disabilities. Um, so let me get my PowerPoint together real quick and share that screen with everyone so we could see the questions as well. All right, and uh, just to reiterate, uh, this program is uh, housed at Northern Arizona University's Institute for Human Development. Um, and within our zone, within our area of coverage, we serve uh, all of Northern Arizona uh, we have three zones in particular. Uh, zone one is mainly the Flagstaff area, all the way up into Tuba City, uh, Page in Colorado City in Arizona. Uh, zone two is the Kingman, Bullhead City uh, area down into Lake Havasu. And I believe that area has now grown into the Yuma area as well. Um, and then there is also zone three. Um, this is the area that I coordinate uh, with uh, several partners throughout the area. And as you see, as you can see, it includes everything east of Winslow and Cayenta as well. Um, we have a strong partnership with Red, Red Mesa Unified School District, um, who are, uh, we have two students today who are actually uh, previous graduates from Red Mesa uh, High School. Um, these are students that, I had met over a year ago. This is our second year working together. Um, and when I started in my role, this was during the time of COVID. So as most may know, the Navajo Nation was closed down to visitors during that time. So in the beginning of my outreach, I had to do a lot of work through Zoom, um, which wasn't uh, as effective as in person at all, but it did allow me to connect with the coordinators at Red Mesa High School who um, invited me down uh, to speak uh, to the students uh, one October in uh, 2021, um, where I got to talk about the program and just talk about going to college in general and students' interest in going to college. And uh, not surprisingly, not too many students uh, uh, really knew who I was at first and um, weren't really interested, but there was one student who was, and uh, we started working um, on that pathway to uh, go to college. He really wanted to go to NAU and really wanted to know how to do that. So we started coaching, having coaching sessions and talking about exactly all the steps it takes to go to college um, and through that work, other students became interested and, and the program uh, has grown uh, tremendously at this point. We have about 16 students that we serve from the Navajo Nation. Uh, we also serve students at NPC locations uh, from Winslow to Holbrook 
to Snowflake, to Sholo, and into the White Mountains. Um, and uh, today you are going to hear from some students in our program, students who have made that transition from high school uh, to college. And give me one second here. Uh, this thing's not working. And we're going to get right into those student panel questions. So uh, today I'd like to introduce and let them introduce themselves to um, Adrian. Are you, are you there? Are you on the call with us? Yes. <clears throat> yes, I am. Uh, a Adrian Black. Sorry about that, Adrian. I should have oh, been whoops. more specific. <laughs> All good. Uh, Adrian, uh, could you please introduce yourself to everyone? Uh, yes, uh, let me properly introduce myself. Um, and uh, I am from one of the students from who just recently graduated from Red Mesa High School. So, um, yeah. Yes, and Adrian graduated in 2022, uh, just for some context there. And our other students there here is Michael Tom. Uh, Michael, are you with us on the call? Yeah. All right, go ahead, Michael. Can, if you could please introduce yourself. All right, um, my name is Michael Tom. Um, my clans are Hushkishni, um, um, I am also one of the students that graduated from Rin Mesa. Awesome. And uh, thank you. I think there was a little mix up on the amount of students, but uh, uh, these are the students who will be on the panel today. Um, and we're going to just get started right in on the questions. So here are the student panel questions. The first one is, uh, how did you figure out what you wanted to be when you grow up. And uh, Adrian, I was wondering if you could lead us off with that. Uh, yeah. Um, so back in like 2018, um, well, actually I never really knew what I wanted to be when I was growing up. But uh, when I grew up, but like back in 2018, I was on a family trip and I was taking pictures during that time and going like later in the day going back through my phone um my family members have noticed that I was taking pictures like in a certain way and like in a I guess in a very artistic expression so um so like from that point on I was showing interest in photography and my older siblings one of my older siblings they um bought me my first camera so from also from that point on I started like getting gifts for like Christmas or birthdays for uh like for photography supplies and which that really helped me express for um the passion of photography and back in 2019 I actually met a photographer who was from the National Dream Geographic he is also um, Navajo too, and um, also like this past month, I got to interview a photographer who was from the Yaki tribe. So, yeah. Michael? I knew when I started high school that I wanted to be a football player because I would train for it and play here and there. I played wide receiver and I felt I was good at it at the position because I trained for it every day. I also became interested in acting because it was like, I liked the movie industry and I liked the ideas of playing different roles. Awesome, thank you guys for those responses. We're gonna go on to the next question here. <clears throat> How did you handle choosing a college or program to attend? So Adrian, if you can lead us, please. Um. In like in the beginning, I never really thought of, um, I was really undecided on going to college or if I should just go to work after high school. But 
like what Renee said when he came to the school back in 2021, I believe. Um, I was recommended to him by one of the um, uh, by one of the teachers there, and from like that point on, he was like telling me or showing me or asking me about my interests, and I I told him about my photography, and he um actually uh told me about the type of degree that I can get in photography. So I was um I was showing some interests in school which he had he would help me do weekly um like zoom calls and uh he helped me like look at schools like Dinner College and NAU in which he showed me the CCC to NAU program uh which that allows me to transfer from the community college to NAU and yeah all right and Michael I started working with an education coach when I was at when I was a senior in high school. I started learning about the different degrees offered at offered at my two favorite schools, ASU and NAU. I really like the CCZ to NAU program because it only takes two years to get to NAU and get an associate's degree in the process. I also wanted to one day try out for the NAU football team. I decided to pursue acting as my major degrees because I hope to get a career in acting after college. So we're gonna have to get you connected with Jimmy Warren because that sounds very similar with the football and acting. Uh, we're gonna go on to the next question. Thank you both for that. Uh, did you have siblings or family members who went to college, uh, Adrian? Um, within my family, there would only be one, which was my uncle, and with me, who, which I am currently going to school. So, like, out of my whole family, it's just me and my uncle who are currently attending um, college. Where does your uncle go to school? Uh, he's actually getting his master's at the Net College. That's awesome. And, uh, for you, Michael, do you have any siblings or family members who went to college? Yes, my mom and her side of the family went to college. Uh, my mom got a degree from Utah State, and she always encouraged me to go to school and try my best at whatever I'm doing at college. My twin brother is also attending college, and we encourage each other to accomplish our dreams and believe in each other. All right, thank you guys. All right, so next question here. Uh, how did you apply for college? And Adrian, lead us up. Uh, well, firstly, uh, during our weekly Zoom calls with my educational coach, I started looking at applications for C2 to NAU. And, um, which that applied to both, uh, or I'm sorry, and that CGC was um, one of the things I needed to apply to both, or the CCC to NAU program, which was um, one of the programs that would help me towards my college pathway. And also with, through the coaching sessions, I started filling out applications and meeting with academic advisors. And Michael, uh, how did you apply for college? And through meetings with my education coach, he walked me through the process of apply, applying, a process of the application for Coconium Community College and CCC to NAU. We did this while I was a senior at high school. All right. And the next question for you both is, how did you pay for college? So how did you, Adrian, pay for college? Uh, well, firstly, with the help of my educational coach, he helped me fill out the FAFSA application and the ONSA application, um, which the FAFSA application was that, uh, which helped me 
uh, get access to the Pell Grant and the Onspa application also helped me get access to the Navajo Nation Scholarship. Um, and with that, all my tuition was paid by the Pell Grant from Extended Funds, which helped me pay for books and other supplies. And I think it's similar, but if you could tell your story, how did you pay for college, Michael? I also signed up for FAFSA, and they paid for all my classes and gave me extra money for books and for rent because I moved out it to move to Flagstaff from Red Mesa to attend college. So yes, uh, Michael was one of those students who did transfer directly from his high school senior year to Flagstaff and uh, has been doing really well in his first academic year. Uh, I can attest to that because we meet weekly and um, I'm super proud of you both for the work that you guys are putting in. Uh, next question. Uh, how did you attend college? So for you, Adrian, how do you attend college? Um, even though I'm an online student, um, I had to learn how to discipline and to be responsible to when I'm logging on to my classes and turn my assignments on time and plan my day to do my homework and which is very important and also a very important thing was to take care of myself at the same time taking care of yourself can you give us some examples of like taking care of yourself and uh, during um, the semester oh uh, both mentally like just to really um not really to stress myself out and also like um just to give myself some self-care. Cool. Uh, and then Michael, for you, how, how did you attend college or currently attend college? Mm, in my first semester of college, I attended in-person and online classes. I moved to an apartment near NAU and this helped me take the bus and walk to campus at Coconino Community College. My friend from back home, decided to also go to Coconino. So we became roommates this semester. And my brother decided to transfer in person from Red Mesa. So he's also studying here now. Yes, uh, they're both studying in, in Flagstaff and it's, it's been a great transition uh, to see you both uh, they're in Flagstaff figuring out the system, how to navigate everything. And uh, we'll go on to the next question that kind of relates. But uh, for you, Adrian, how do you get to class? Um, well, for when I'm uh, getting ready for my online classes, I would get my notebook ready or my textbooks if, if it was needed. Um, or sometimes I would like clean up and get myself ready for before um, classes are on and which sometimes I would um, log into class like five minutes before and then I'm ready to engage. Nice. And Michael, you kind of talked about it with like moving near NAU, being close to CCC, which is where you're going to take your gen ed classes. But if you want to like elaborate a little bit more about how you get to classes. Mm, okay. Oh. Um, how I get to class, I walk or either take the NAU shuttle. Um, I prefer walking more because I like the exercise and the quiet and the fresh air too. Nice. All righty. So next question here. Thank you for that, both of you. Uh, how do you get help with your assignments, Adrian? Um, when you're in the semester and you need some help with with your work, how do you, how do you go about that? Um, well, I would email my peers or sometimes I would set up Zoom meetings with my professor when, when classes or when we don't have classes that day or when I'm having my weekly meeting with my educational coach, I would ask for help. I would ask them for help as well. And Michael, how do you get help with the, your assignments during the semester? I get, um, I work with my education coach. Um, I got connected with tutors at my college. I also get, I also got coached on how to ask my professor for help. 
and emailing them to and about questions and other stuff. Cool. Thank you both for that. Um, next question here for the panel. Uh, how do you plan your class schedule to go to college, Adrian? Um, I would like to say very, um, I would like to say very organized by writing down notes, like when things are due or um, just information that is important for me to know. So when I'm having my weekly meeting with my edu educational coach, I would also write down things that are important. Uh, and for you, Michael, how do you plan your class uh, schedule for college? My education coach taught me how to schedule a meeting with an academic advisor and help me come up with questions that I should ask. My academic advisor was able to help me enroll in classes and give me suggestions on what classes I should take. Cool. Thank you. And uh, next question. So uh, how do you stay organized during the week? Uh, with work and college. And I think uh, we were going to take out work because neither of you work currently in the semester. Both of you were working at the beginning, uh, but now as we're in the second semester of college, you guys are mostly focused on college. So how do you stay organized during the week as a college student with your classes, Adrian? Uh, just like what Renee was saying, um, like how we were working for because I was working a seasonal job before. Um, but with not working um, during this time, I just mostly do my weekly checkups with uh, my education coach just to help me stay on track with my classes. And, and for you, Michael, how do you stay organized during the week? Being in a different place too, being in person, how do you stay organized with everything you got going on? Mm, I do um, coaching sessions um, to which I look up for looking up my, my assignments that I do weekly and that come up with a plan and we get them all done. All my classes this semester are in person, so I know which days and times that need that I need to go to. Um, I, I meet with my education coach weekly, so we both know what to do soon and what I need to prepare for. Excellent, thank you guys so much. Um, I do wanna um, say that this concludes our, our panel for, for college and transitioning to college and some of the you know challenges and barriers and how these uh, young adults have really uh, face these challenges and barriers head on and, and continue to be successful college students. Uh, we can take some questions uh, for the audience at this time. We don't have uh, too many, too much other things planned, but if y'all have some questions, maybe we can, uh, especially from the youth who are, you know, curious about how do you go to college? How do I start? You know, what, what are some things I can do to get ready? I think our, our students uh, here can help. Adrian and Michael, Betty Schoen has posed a question. How did you both get connected with an education coach and where are they based? All right, so um, Adrian kind of spoke at that at the beginning, but if you want to remind them, Adrian, a little bit about um, how you got connected with me and, and where you're from as well. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Um... So back in 2021, I was actually recommended to Renee by one of the um, uh, resource teachers out there and um, which uh, Renee actually helped me um, find an interest in college. And uh, I don't know about the, the base of that. And I, the second part was like, where are you based? So where are you living now? Where are you doing college from? Oh, uh, I'm currently living at home, which is a Red Mesa. So. Yeah. Red Mesa up in the four corners of Arizona near Utah. Uh, and uh, so go ahead, Michael. How did, how did you get connected with an education coach? 
Mm, I got connected through Rene. He came over to the school, and then that's where I knew. And uh, we got a, a question. Uh, so are the sessions virtual? Uh, sometimes uh, they are virtual, but particularly when these students were at Red Mesa Community, I mean, high school, uh, I was going there every other week. So it was a combination of in-person coaching um, and online coaching. It was mainly in-person in the beginning, uh, building, you know, first that, that trust, that relationship, and that partnership with the student. And uh, then as, you know, time went on and the transitions kind of changed them, we, we stick to more virtual at this point, but we do have students who are uh, in the same position right now as Adrian and Michael were uh, in high school, um, who are on their transition path towards college um, at several institutions, not just NAU. There are our students who are interested in Navajo Technical University, um, and you know we're working on a plan towards that, uh, Eastern Arizona College, um, and even students who are interested in job course. So uh, the way our program looks at uh, transition for youth um, is, is that any kind of program, any kind of training that leads uh, to a meaningful career or certification in that industry, uh, that's how we're classifying post-secondary education. Dr. Joseph posed a question for the students. What superpowers do you use? So Adrian, you wanna go ahead and answer that first? Um, yeah, um, I think for me, at, uh, currently at this time uh, in college, I think it would be to be really disciplined with myself. <laughs> so yeah. And then for you, Michael? My superpower would probably be probably discipline. Yeah. Definitely. And, um, you know, I, I know these two students very well, and we work uh, together weekly. So um, it's amazing for me as a, as a coach and a mentor to see their growth and see their potential just blossom with each you know, new challenge that they overcome. And uh, one of the things that our program really highlights is learning how to self-advocate for yourself and modeling those techniques of how do you advocate for yourself as a student to go to college? And what are the kind of questions you should be asking if you wanna go to college? And um, who do you ask help for? So um, we, we work as, we focus on that and also that resiliency uh, piece too, because uh, college is is not like high school, and and there's a lot more independence with college. And uh, you got midterms, uh, you got the beginning of the semester where you really need to start to learn about the class and read the syllabus, and and then the final exams. It's it's really a marathon, and uh, that's where our coaching sessions come in. We're 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 talking about this um, as it's happening. Um, I you I really use my experience as well in academic advising to to uh, motivate the students and let them know where they're at in the semester and be that extra resource for them if they have any questions or concerns. Um, a big part of our program is also teaching our students the front door for services of a college. So like, how do you access academic advising and how is that useful to you? Uh, how do you access financial aid and how do you keep yourself you know, funded as a college student. Um, and then also how do you access disability resource services uh, within the college campus? Because uh, that is the right of every student um, at an at a in-state institution to have access to those ADA services. Um, the Navajo Nation itself has its own laws that predate the ADA. So um, that's already established there. Um, but within, you know, public institutions, state institutions, teaching students about their rights, the ADA, and what what they should be looking for uh, to advocate for themselves is, is something that's an ongoing process and, and discussion. And uh, 
So this is like my contact information as a coach. We have a website right here. Um, and that website has an interest form. If anyone is interested, please feel free to take a picture of this screen and check out the website. Um, I do primarily work in Northern Arizona, Northeast Arizona, as I showed on the map. We have several zones. Uh, we are in our third year as a grant, and we look forward to continuing till 2025 and hopefully uh, renewing our grant at that time. So thank you to, to our youth, Adrian and Michael, for showing up. Thank you guys so much. And thank you to the panel organizers um, and uh, definitely uh, Christy, Christy Kelly, Grace, uh, for reaching out to me and uh, making me aware of how we can participate and, and support uh, the growth and empowerment of Indigenous youth in Arizona. Thank you so much. Thank you, Renee. Thank you, Adrian. Thank you, Michael. You guys are great, great panels. Thank you for that information. And as the chair to the summit, um, we'd like to invite you both to serve on our planning committee, option one. And then the other thing I'd like to reach out to you is that, you know, as students, I know it's always important to have mentors. Um, I was a student too, up until last year, I finished my doctoral in healthcare administration at 55 years old, um, 55 years young, that's what I'll go with. And um, I'd like to extend to you, if you need any mentors, I'm always open to creating allies as a sponsor. So I wanna wish you well on your academic journey as you continue your um, uh, schooling. Thank you as Native scholars, you're both doing well. Very proud of you. Thank you. Um, so on our agenda, we have our closing and we chose to close with a poem by Mateo Treetop. And this poem is an award-winning poem. So I'll let Mateo share the history behind his award-winning poem. And after that, um, that will conclude our program. So go ahead, Mateo. All right. <laughs> so um, this, uh, this poem that I wrote, uh, you know, it's a, uh, like Kimberly said, it is a award-winning poem. Um, I wrote I wrote it uh, for the uh, the Scottsdale Community College uh, Voitex. Um, it is a nationally recognized publication of uh, of <laughs> art of all kinds, from uh, photography, short stories, and poetry, as well as plays. Um, I submitted it to the. Uh, uh, to the publication's uh, Native Visions and Voices section uh, that showcases uh, different uh, Native students. Uh, uh, again, photography, um, poetry, short story, uh, plays, and <laughs> it won first place. And as well, uh, uh, the publication got submitted for a uh, a regional competition uh, for uh, the community colleges in the southwest uh, region of the United States, where it has won third place. So, um, just a little bit about uh, this poem in particular. Uh, it is about a Native American leader uh, who is Santi, a uh, Santi. Uh, Dakota, I believe that's the uh, that's his uh, tribal affiliation. Uh, his name was uh, John Trudell, um, and he was a great orator and a great native leader that uh, you know tried to lead uh, people in a way of living more uh, in a traditional way. Um, so I'll go on and read uh, from the, uh, uh, read my poem now. <clears throat> oh, and it's called Graffiti Man. <clears throat> Lines from a minded mind, a mind of and beyond his time, seeking, speaking, understanding, what the world should be, what it isn't. 
That is why he is dangerous. He speaks the truth, seeking out lies, understanding the ways in which they control you. Tagging his name in the embers, the burning embers of red, white, and blue. Graffiti man starting the writer's tombs, remembering when Tina smiled. Uh, he continued to tag his name on the airwaves in paper, speaking to blue Indians about living in reality and the industrial slave. How he took aim at Uncle Sam, uh, trying to send a message. Uncle Sam, I grew up in the baby boom che days. Listening to Elvis, I was part of his first wave as part of your naval crew uh, in the 60s. From that, I learned what to do. When the flag is desecrated, you burn it. But you, <laughs> but see, you've been desecrating your flag for years with your racism, sexism, classism, dragging your colors to the social mud. You know you should burn them. Let me help you. Uh, John Trudell a.k.a. Graffiti Man. Mitakuye Orichin, Palamia Mateo. That was beautiful. Thank you. And that concludes our program. Um, please uh, fill out the brief survey, and we look forward for you joining us next year for our fourth annual American Indian Youth Disability Summit. Thank you all for joining us. Have a great rest of your weekend.